Hi everyone, this is Robert and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Today is an open Q&A about A Song of Ice and Fire. We may stretch even further into other fandoms as well. But today uh, we are going to be... Oh, hang on, I've got... There we go, we've got to turn the volume off. Um, so I think we'll just kick off straight away and go straight into it. As always, what I've tried to do is gather questions from my patrons. That's one of the benefits of being a patron of this channel is the chance to um, uh, get questions in advance for these live streams. As with all open Q&As, this is going to dot around quite a lot. So uh, expect this to move around from subject to subject, and I will try and rattle through these as quickly as possible so I can get to as many questions from the chat as well. Um, let's start with uh, a couple of questions I had. Uh, Marvin Martin, thank you so much uh, for the super chat, uh, asking if the North stopped the Andals, why are the children of the forest not in the North? Uh, this is because there is, um, in terms of timing, the... Uh, the children of the forest were there before humanity arrived. And then you get the first men who came up and moved their way up through Westeros. And the children of the forest tried a few different ways to stop them. Then we had the pact. The pact was what, agree what uh, led to the agreement that the children of the forest were allowed the deep forests and humanity would uh, have the rest of the land. The Andals arrived thousands of years later. So um, in terms of why are the children of the forest not in the north, uh, well, that that happened a very, very long time ago. This was already distant memory by the time the Andals arrived. The children of the forest by then were left in the south, in the Isle of Faces, and in the north, just probably even north of the wall. There may be, we do not know, we don't have any kind of corroboration of this, but there may be some children of the forest just hidden in the deepest and darkest of woods, like, say, the Wolf's Wood and places like that. But that's uh, what it is. The answer is that there is a huge time gap between the two. A Smith Crazy, thank you so much, saying, Hi, Robert, love the open Q&A. Excellent. I try and do these every now and then just to... Because uh, I know if you do the focused Q&A, then that gets a lot of questions in on that issue, but people have burning questions on a range of things, so I try and do these every now and then. Uh, after the big battles coming up and the potential scouring of the Shire set, which may be smaller, uh, sorry, uh, after the potential scouring of the Shire, which may be smaller houses do you think may benefit or thrive at the end of the books? Uh, I mean, it's a interesting question. I think that the war the wars that are there will encompass the entire uh, Seven Kingdoms. So in terms of which houses will survive or thrive, I don't think anyone's going to thrive. And I think that's one of the big things that George R. R. Martin is trying to show us through his work is the fact that war affects everyone. You can't just sit out. It just this is this is going to take over everywhere. So um, a few of the places that as it stands in the books, are well out of it, are places like in the Vale of Arryn, um, and also some parts, it has to be said, down in Dawn as well. Um, I, it would not surprise me if some of the houses in the Vale of Arryn still do get away with it. Um, the, the evasion from the north... Uh, will come down perhaps as far as the Riverlands in the books, uh, but probably there will be some parts of the Vale of Arryn which may well survive. Um, in terms of who's going to thrive, I mean, I don't know, and I don't think we're going to see this. I, I, this is something that I, I, I feel I say a lot, but I, it's almost certainly where this is going to go. George R. R. Martin isn't going to give us the 20 years later. He's going to finish the story when the story finishes. And that will leave some things hanging over, some things we simply do not know. There will be characters who get put in a position, and we don't know if they're going to do well in it. There are going to be houses which are going to be established, and we don't know where they're going to go. So this is the, the frustrating thing which almost certainly will happen, is we do not know which houses will thrive and survive. We also don't... 
at the risk of it going even slightly more meta, we don't know whether the house system itself will survive. And he probably won't show us. I suspect that we're not going to have a complete overhaul of the way that Westeros works. Uh, but whether houses as a concept survive is still slightly up in arms. Um, question from uh, Josiah M. Oh, actually, I didn't see. Oh, it was just just saying hi. Then, <laughs> in which case, hi. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the super chat, uh, Rob D. Thank you very much. Saying hi, Robert. Hope you're. Uh, hope you keep doing the open Q and A streams. Have you considered doing one on the Song of Ice and Fire theory icebergs? Um. I'm not 100% sure I get the theory icebergs thing, but I will definitely keep on doing open Q&A streams. That the, the idea looking forward for this channel is obviously that at some point we're going to start getting TV shows returning, at which point we can start focusing on in on them. We're going to get House of the Dragon in a year or so, probably a little bit before that. We're going to be getting the uh, Lord of the Rings show, Definitely before that, we're going to be getting The Witcher so we can start focusing in on those different things. Until then, definitely carrying on with the open Q&A. Um, and I'm thinking probably over the summer then I might experiment with a couple of Lord of the Rings ones, see how people uh, like that. In terms of A Song of Ice and Fire theories, yeah, I, um, then um, I'm happy to do ones on the theories as a whole if that's what you mean um mo 11 thank you very much saying what's your favorite house region and century since the conquest uh p.s good job man i'm a big big fan uh another no other youtuber gets a song of ice and fire like you well thank you that's a very kind thing to say um as far as my favorite house i, I mean it's it's either House Dane or House Reed, and both of them is because of the mystery. <laughs> both of them, um, we that there's clearly secrets going on, and we do not know them, and that really intrigues me. Um, region, and I don't know what favorite favorite could mean various things. Uh, I find the North fascinating, but in terms of where I would live, then definitely the Reach. Uh, that is just nicer. Uh, sunshine um uh, beautiful things around flowers beautiful castles it's it seems you know when the world's greatest library uh it, it seems like a, a good place to live so that would be in terms of a century i'm not entirely ah oh, i mean this is a tough one i i wouldn't want to live under the dragons i have to say uh so the first century or so leading up to the, the dance of the dragons probably not um the the last few years under the mad king again probably not as targaryen power was wilting so maybe maybe that bit at the 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 first two hundreds and so that that might work quite well. I mean, if I had to say, Aegon the Fifth, Egg, probably he was the one who tried to give rights to the small folk to to the normal people of this world. If I had to pick any era, then it would probably be that uh, post uh, invasion. Um. Uh, AK Channel TV saying, hi, Robert, what do you think George R. R. Martin is trying to say thematically with all of the body or face swapping? <laughs> and here's to all the rest of it. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of what he's trying to say thematically with all the body stroke face swapping, there is a lot of face swapping. Um, and particularly with that house of black and white but this is actually he goes a bit more meta with this is that it's the name swapping which is the thing which fascinates me is some characters Arya for example you understand completely the theme that's going on here with Arya is that she has if you go through she has got a dozen or more names before she even gets to Bravos, she has a dozen or more names given to her Arya, she's Ari, she's Arya Underfoot, Arya Horseface. Um, 
she takes on lots and lots of different names and personalities as she's going through her journey. And that makes sense because it's building up to being a faceless man. Other characters, however, have different names all the time. And not only that, but George R. R. Martin names them in different ways. So he he starts out book one, everybody's chapter is just named after the person. But by the time you're getting down to book five, and I assume this is going to carry on into the last two books, then the names are more descriptive. So we have, I mean, the previous chapter from the Winds of Winter, we have Aya is Mercy, and then we have Elaine, for uh, which is what Sansa's name is at the time, and every and you have the Turncloak, and you have um, just descriptive chapter names. So what George R. R. Martin, I think, is trying to show us that people are getting subsumed within this story. This sounds very literary, but I think this is what he's trying to say, is that who they are is being subsumed within their story. Now, I think what you will see, because the story is currently at the why this point at right now is going to start contracting back. What you will start to see is that these characters, many of them, will reclaim their names and identities. So Sansa will become Sansa. Her chapter titles will be Sansa again towards the end. Arya, it's going to be a huge moment when her chapters again are Aya, Ditto Theon. He, his his chapters have have not generally been Theon recently. When he becomes Theon properly, that is going to show that his character arc has come come back fully, and he is himself. So I think that is what it is that George R. R. Martin is trying to show through this and. Different identities are massive through this story, far more than I suspect he originally intended, well, I say he originally intended, far more than was indicated in the first book. He loves doing different characters with different identities. Um, Carl Karsnock saying, Robert is a man of refined taste. I am. Um, so question from AK Channel TV. Again, thank you. Do you think Egg was trying to sacrifice himself or his family to bring dragons back at Summerhall? Also, who would you rather fight under Tywin? Uh, who would you rather fight under Tywin or Stannis? Um, so... Um, the second one, Stannis. Ty, Tywin, I mean, they both, they don't have much of a sense of humour, um, but I think that uh, Stannis, at least, although he's in the wrong, um, he's, uh, I, I think, like Davos, I could see that he means well. Um, so uh, that's, probably, whereas Tywin is just about his family. Stannis is trying to serve. When I say he means well, he's trying to serve what he thinks is justice and truth and the right, whereas Tywin is just about him and his family. Um, do I think Egg was trying to sacrifice himself or his family to bring dragons back at Summer Hall? I don't think he was. Uh, I, I suspect he wasn't trying to kill anyone. I suspect that there will have been some blood there. I think that he will have been told that there has to be sacrifice. I think that this is something, but I do not think that he will have reached the point. Maybe, maybe he will. Maybe, maybe Duncan Egg's going to take a very dark turn and he will actually be trying to sacrifice people. But I, I suspect that we're going to see that um, he was going heavy on the fire and not so much on the blood in order to try and bring people back. As it happened, though, the the, the outcome of Summer Hall, whether it was intended or not, was that we get a, a dead king, Aegon V, King's Blood. Uh, we get a dead 
heir-ish. He was due to be king at one point, Duncan Targaryen, Aegon's son, and also Dunk himself. And Dunk, many, many times we see through the first three of the Duncan Egg stories, he his life is sort of uh, sacrificially there um, in place of a prince, king's blood in some way. People die with the 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 trial by combat, trial by seven in the first story, people of royal blood die for him, trying not to do huge spoilers, but people of royal blood die for him. And he wonders about this. What is it? What's the purpose of this? So the outcome is that we get three bits of effective king's blood and we get fire, fire and blood. And what do we get? Do we get the dragon eggs hatching? No, but we do get a new dragon, Rhaegar Targaryen, who was born at the tragedy at Summerhall. Uh, Poison Biscuits, are we going through patron questions now? Uh, now we've got, I've got a load of patron questions I am coming to. Um, I've, I'm working my way through a, a few questions in the chat at the moment. Um, and uh, Lexki1, thank you very much. Very generous, saying no question. Thanks for the great videos. Thank you very much. I hugely appreciate that. Um, let's uh, go to some questions from my patrons. Um, Lady Pushkins. Hi, Robert. Uh, currently rereading the books and watching the show. In the books, when Miri Mazdur is in the tent, Danny sees shadows. A great wolf, this is a quote, a great wolf, uh, another like a man wreathed in flames. Is this foreshadowing? Um, so, yeah, this is if you cast your mind back to book one, season one, when uh, Danny is uh, there and Drogo is injured, and she says to Miri Mazdur, bring him back, and Miri Mazdur is going, oh, this is, you know, bring me his horse, his horse will have to die, do not enter this tent, and what she says is, uh, for the dead will dance here tonight, and that, I think, is the only clue we have as to who these shadows are, Miri Mazdur says, the dead will dance here. So I don't think this is foreshadowing. I don't think this is looking forward to people who have some impact in the future on Danny's story. This is perhaps people who are already dead, who have some importance. Um, and in terms of a great wolf who has died recently in the story, Ned Stark? I mean, it's... It's deliberately not spelt out in any way who these characters are. Um, and another, like a man wreathed in flames, um, that could be one of many people who've been burned by fire. But I think the point is that, uh, that this isn't looking forward. This isn't a prophecy about people who will impact on Danny's life in the future. This is Miri Mazdur saying, these are the dead. And so we look at, uh, well, we can speculate on which dead they may be that that have been uh, summoned there effectively by Miri Mazdur, but really it's, uh, it's not just, I guess, sort of pretty language from George R. R. Martin. There is something to it, but this is dead people, not people who will be important in the future. Um, Michael James, uh, are the children of landed knights considered highborn? Well, highborn's a bit of an odd concept uh, in Westeros. So uh, a landed knight is um, someone who has property, so will have a castle or whatever, uh, and then their child will inherit that. Now, that makes them effectively a very, very local lord. Now, they may have some uh, people uh, who uh, owe fealty to them, or they may not. 
Um, does that make them highborn? Well, yes, but sort of the lowest rank. So if you were to um, if you were to look at nobility, say in England, then it has various sort of ranks, and you get the highest. You know, obviously you get your kings and queens, and then you go down to the princes, and then your dukes, and then your I don't know, whatever it is next, earls or whatever, then barons are at the bottom level of uh, being a, no a, a noble, and you get knights who are sort of the top level of being the uh, the middle classes, I guess is probably the way to say it. If you were a landed knight, then you are sort of heading towards the the, the upper leagues um it's not ever made a hundred percent clear but it, it does appear to be a hereditary the land thing going on and so you would then um be uh your children would inherit it and perhaps they could expand the territory or something in those ways um question from Uh, Boris Orozco. Hello, Robert. Boris from Sarasota, Florida. Hi there, Florida. Do you think after A Dream of Spring and a few centuries later, the world uh, will be uh, moving to an industrial society? Um, I, possibly. I think that you have to ask what are the things that are holding it back from being an industrial society now the the biggest thing in westeros frankly is the citadel having a monopoly on knowledge and you have to in order to understand how things work and all the rest of it you have to go to the citadel and you have to start training at least as a maester that has to be in some way opened up or democratized now uh, the what you find intriguing so in actually i'll take a step back for a moment george r, r. martin does base a lot of this on sort of the western world and the biggest thing in terms of uh industrialization that as the biggest impact upstream in my view, was the printing press, so Gutenberg and all the rest of it, because that allowed people, that allowed mass printing of books, that allowed the explosion of knowledge. Once you get that explosion of knowledge, then lots of different people can start inventing things. So that is the sort of the, the iteration there. What we have in the world of ice and fire is that clearly the maesters and the citadel are a huge source of knowledge, but there's also Essos and other continents which are completely different. And we hear about Yi Ti, which is in many ways an analogue for China, which had huge amounts of progress and civilization earlier on. Also, we hear about Bravos, and Bravos appear to be able to create a war galley in one day. That's what we're told. Now, in order to do that, then they have to have some degree of mechanization or something along those lines that will allows them in their arsenal, which is very famous, where they build all of these galleys that allows them to build things so swiftly. So there is a degree of mechanization slash industrialization sort of just on the horizon. Might it happen in the world of A Song of Ice and Fire? Definitely could, uh, but I don't think we're going to find out, but yes, it could. But the key certainly in Westeros is what happens with the knowledge. Is there a way that knowledge can be expanded out beyond Old Town? Uh, question from Roman Lakovets saying, there seems to be some evidence in the books that Tyrion could be Aerys's son. Personally, I don't like the idea, but what do you think? Um, well, I... I have to admit, out of all... So is Tyrion a Targaryen, is this question. Out of all of the theories that are out there, this is the one that I have wavered on the most. I Every time I think about it, I 
kind of come down one way or the other. I tend to, the where this will end, and I'll give you a little bit more information, but where this will end is that I tend to the view that George R. R. Martin is never going to conclusively tell us. He's just going to give us some hints that maybe this is the case, but maybe it isn't the case. Now, I am keeping a careful eye out for this in my reread or re-listen. I'm going through a song of ice and fire. For those who don't do not know, over on Twitter, I'm putting up my thoughts as I go through chapter by chapter. One of the things I'm keeping a keen eye or ear out for is this Tyrian Targaryen link. Is it possible? And I would say that the first two or three chapters of Tyrion very strongly hints at dragons. Now, when I say that, it, he gives a huge amount of his history. He talks about how when he was younger, then he used to dream of dragons, how he used to stare into the flames for hours. He talks about when he visited King's Landing and he'd heard that the dragon skulls were down hidden in the depths and he goes hunting for them under the Red Keep and he sees them and we hear his thoughts and they seem friendly and welcoming which is completely different to when Arya goes there when the language is very aggressive they, they're biting at her effect I mean not actually literally doing it but that's the language is that they do not like her and want her gone but Tyrion feels safe there and there is a lot that seems to kind of possibly hint at it so at the moment i'm kind of erring on the side of well maybe um on the other side it works really well for me that the one child that tywin effectively disowns is the child that is most like him and he is very like Tywin. His brain works very like Tywin's, very um, calculating, very incisive. Uh, unlike Cersei and Jamie, who actually don't come across as very Tywin-like at all, apart from their pride and their love of the family name. So... I kind of that there is something in it. Is the short the short thing is that there is something in this. It's not just a made up theory with no evidence behind it. There is definitely something in it. There are lots of hints. I will keep on keeping an eye out for it as I go through my reread, um, and I will let people know if I come to a conclusion. But I suspect that we will end up at the position where George R. Martin does not fundamentally tell us one way or the other. The the final thing I would say on this is that regardless of whether he is or isn't, he, that he does write Tyrion with a lot of echoes of both John and Danny. And what I mean by that is that they didn't know their, um, if he is a Targaryen, he didn't know either of their parents. Uh, the mother died at childbirth. Um, they are in, in one way or another sort of ostracized as children. Um, this is, there are lots of echoes across the three of them and they are in one way of interpreting this story. They are the three central characters. Bran may be one of the most important, but the thematically those three do seem to be uh, very, very close. Question from Hark the Morbid Angel, uh, saying, Hello, Robert, is it possible that Benjen left the dragon glass that Ghost found at the Fist of the First Men? Um, yes, uh, it is possible. Um, but my uh, general take, and indeed, uh, Jerry Ormore Mont is of the view that there are so many of the Night's Watch going on this uh, great ranging that if Benjen is out there, he would definitely know that they're coming. They're, they're leaving a, a huge trail behind them. Uh, and so he would know to go to the Fist of the First Men. So we do have this possibility that's there. However, it's not just Dragonglass that's left there. Uh, it 
is Dragonglass and a Horn, which I think is almost certainly the Horn of Winter. Now, these are things which are being left in order to help the Night's Watch against the others. The Dragonglass clearly does. The Horn, if this is the Horn of Winter, again, will definitely help them in the fight against the others. So somebody who's done that is trying to get them to help uh, trying to help the Night's Watch against the others and specifically gets Ghost to find this. The way that this cache is found, it's different in the books to on the show, the way this is found is that Ghost goes off and finds it and John goes chasing after. So And that and digs up this recently buried uh, cache inside what appears to be a Night's Watch cloak. My guess is that this is, and there's many videos I've done on Blood Raven, but my guess is that this is another one of those things that Blood Raven is just pushing to John to nudge him towards understanding uh, what his destiny is as well as uh, trying to equip John to be the person who can help in defending the realms of men against the others. So I think that's what it is. Uh, the, in terms of um, the Night's Watch cloak, this was definitely there in order to assure John and the Night's Watch that this was a friendly gift, not something else. This came from a member of the Night's Watch. Bloodraven himself obviously had a Night's Watch cloak. He was a member of the Night's Watch, but he also, when he went north and disappeared, he didn't go by himself. He also had a couple of people with him. Maybe they survived uh maybe one of them is cold hands in fact uh and certainly this gives the option for him being go to bury this in a place that he knows that the night's watch are um uh behavish desai saying hi robert i love listening to your theories given how important it was why did ned take ice to king's landing he didn't carry it during the war Um, so no, he didn't carry it during the war. Ice is not a, a war weapon. It is a ceremonial sword. And I think this is, I mean, this probably says a lot about how stark is that when they did get their Valyrian steel sword, they did not order one that would be great in battle and bring them great honor. This was something that would be used for beheadings basically for for issuing the justice from the uh the kings of winter now why did he take it to king's landing because he was then the king's justice and i think that the george R. R. martin is trying to show us the difference between the king that's down there who does not dispense his own justice he has got an executioner and ned who will do the executing himself. So all the way through, we see this again and again and again, is that you get, uh, when you get uh, the whole issue on the King's Road with um, Arya and Nymeria, and Nymeria attacks uh, 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 Joffrey, and the sentence is to kill Lady, because Nymeria has run off, uh, Ned insists on doing this himself, not having some executioner come and do it for him. But Robert Baratheon happily, all the time, keeps on getting people to go off and do his dirty work for him. So this is a, um, it's it's taken down there to show, first of all, because it's Ned's sword, but secondly, to show the difference between Ned and his personal honour and what is happening uh, uh, in the rest of the world. Uh, Andrew K saying, I missed um, Super Chat from Jibadol. Uh, apologies there, Jibadol. Uh, how will Tyrion lose his tongue? Because we all know it's going to happen. Uh, yeah, so if you haven't come across this theory before, it's quite a convincing one. Um, I'm, as I say, I'm doing my re-listen. I'm half, two-thirds of the way through book one, already twice people have said to Tyrion, you know what, somebody, someday someone's going to cut your tongue out. And it's like, oh, hang on a moment. And I know this happens. I, I haven't been counting, but I know this happens again 
at least once, probably a few more times later in the books. So this does seem to be foreshadowing, and there are lots of instances across the piece in terms of other characters losing their tongues. And um, the question is, is that leading somewhere thematically towards Tyrion losing his tongue? Added to which there's a great theory that I... I, I love that you get um, all three of the Lannister siblings lose the thing that they value the most. Jamie loses his right hand, his ability to fight. Cersei is losing her um, her looks, and Tyrion will lose his tongue, uh, which is the the way he talks himself out of everything. So that um, that all absolutely makes sense. How will will this happen? And if so, um, how and who? The person who is left around who is most likely to do it is Euron. That is not going to happen until Tyrion gets back to Westeros, in which case it's not going to happen until uh, the winds of winter. So, um, I mean, I, I, I hope it won't, because, <laughs> I, I, I mean, Tyrion's not a nice person, but I love the character and I love the way that he talks, and I think that that would remove something from him his chapters by not hearing him do all of the talking um question from uh ricky mcculloch uh saying what limitations do you think may be applied to glass candles to ensure not narrative breaking proximity to magic or certain people to use uh or do they run out um yeah, so this is something George R. Martin is very aware of, is that magic can uh, give you huge amounts of extra information. And uh, he his entire story, uh, storytelling uh, conceit is by hiding bits of information from us. This is why each chapter is from somebody's perspective, so we only know what they know. We don't have this from this kind of omniscient third-person godlike character who understands everything and explains it all to us. So this is the way that uh, he has chosen to do it. And that does mean sometimes we get these, uh, I mean, if you were being uncharitable, you would say rather clunky cutting people off uh, while they're about to say something or think about something. It happens a lot with Sir Barristan and is incredibly frustrating when he's about to think about or talk about something that happened back in Robert's Rebellion or something like that. But uh, glass candles, I think the way that we're going to prevent this from sort of giving us too much information is simply that none of the characters that we have or none of the characters that we have POVs from will own a glass candle. That's, I think, the short answer. They are rare. There are some in the Citadel. I don't think Sam's going to get hold of one. Marwin the Mage definitely has one, but I don't think we're likely to have a POV chapter from him. There are various other ones dotted around Essos, but again... We're going to be moving from Essos relatively soon. So I think that's the 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 short answer is that we're just not going to have a POV character who has them. Um, question from... Uh, I think I did that one already from Hark the Morbid Angel. Um, Kahuna Gaming, what would be your one hope for the upcoming spin-off? Uh, I don't know if I have one hope for it. I mean, other than it's good, and that sounds um, really just like really boring, but I, I just, I, I want people who love the text and love the world to be owning this and uh, to open up this um, this world we have. The, the the story of the Dance of the Dragons is a big story, but we've only got, I, I mean, I don't know, 100, 150 pages maybe in uh, Fire and Blood about what happened there. Now, compare that to what we had for the TV show Game of Thrones, which had five massive books, thousands, pardon me, thousands of pages, 
And so their problem was squashing it down into a TV show. What the issue for House of the Dragon is going to be, and even more so for the other rumoured spin-offs that we've got, Corlys Velaryon's Travels, um, uh, the uh, Nymeria, Martell's Arrival, things like that. But it's expanding a small amount of sm uh, of uh, material out into a large amount of TV show. And how they handle that difference, I think, from me, will be the, the key, because it's not a matter of contracting what we've got. It's a matter of adding in new stuff. And the new stuff maybe this is my one hope the new stuff has to not contradict what we've got already it has to add to it and add to the world in a good way that we love um hark the morbid angel saying if moon boy sir dontos patchface and butterbumps were to start a band uh would they call it motley crew uh, I'll keep up the the top uh, keep up the top tier content. Uh, I like the joke. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, they were all uh, let's call them jesters. Um, Abby Neil, uh, well, I always get your name wrong. Abby, thank you for becoming a patron by the way last weekend, uh, last week. Uh, and I I'm just going to call you Abby if you don't mind, so I don't have to try and mangle your surname. Which is your favourite of the five books and why? And who is your favourite character? Enjoying the stream night uh, tonight from Ireland. Um, my favourite character I've said several times before i think is Tyrion. it's still Tyrion. that doesn't mean i like him uh, but i find his pov chapter to be the most insightful and interesting and fascinating so i love uh him as a character in terms of my favorite book i mean this may change um i'm i'm quite a big fan of a dance with dragons it has to be said um but so probably that or a clash with clash of kings and, and i know i know that, that there are many aficionados who sort of like uh Im implies book three or four or, or would not just imply would say strongly it's book three or four four but i i think in terms of pure enjoy enjoyment a clash of kings works perfectly for me because having set things up in in game of thrones this is when the story then just starts expanding out into being whoa hang on a moment so theon wasn't just this like random hanger on actually he's got his own plot point going on there this isn't just threat of war this is all out war uh, the characters head off on their own arcs Arya previously was just like this kid who who was there following around where um Ned takes her, but now suddenly she's got her own volition and doing her own thing. The hound heads up. The, the whole the the whole world expands for me. So for me, reading the stories for the first time, that was the book where suddenly I went from, well, this is a good story to, wow, there's there's many layers to this. And A Dance of the Dragons is for me the book that rewards multiple reads the most when you get more out of it the more times you go back into it um <laughs> that's gul 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 saying oh so this is what you look like hi uh this is indeed how i look um kelly johnson who killed septon moon i did uh, a whole video on that one if you're interested kelly so do please go and check that one out uh in uh, the the short version i would recommend that you look to see who benefits from this and um i, th I think there's one clear answer to who benefits from this and it's not it, and and once you've taken out the people who clearly weren't doing things like the the ruling cabal over in king's landing and and house hightower who is it that actually does not want to have a huge army outside um, the their city um a lot of the time and and who is it who can hide the history and and write exactly uh what happened it's the maesters so uh, i've got a lo much longer bit of um 
uh, thinking behind that. Uh, Lady Pushkin saying there were some more bits to my Patreon question if you get time. Yeah, I've got them. Uh, I will come to them uh, in a, just a little bit, Lady Pushkin's. Um, uh, I think that's... Um, uh, oh, Andrew K saying I had a missed super chat from Dominican Stud 101. Uh, apologies. Let's see whether I can come back to that one. Oh, 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 oh. I hope it's not gone off the top. It might have gone off the top of the chat. So apologies for that one. I will see whether I can find that one later. Uh, question from... Um, I'm sure I had another one coming out. Oh, yeah. We had, here we go. Reflective Rambling. Oh, hi there, Reflective Rambling. Saying, oh, this is a question for uh, Holly Brady. Uh, saying, uh, and thank you. I love it when people do this, picking up questions for other people. I want, I was wondering how Euron expects to survive the upcoming battle at Old Town. Does he have a plan for what happens if the sacrifice works and the Krakens rise from the depths? Okay, so... Um, ish is the answer to this one firstly i think we need to distinguish between the battle that's about to happen and the battle for old town i think the battle that's about to happen is not the battle of old town first this is a sea battle which is going to be happening we've got a the red wine fleet coming around imperial fleet we've got um lots of uh lots of boats coalescing in one place off the south coast of westeros near to old town but not at old town now that will create a huge sea battle and euron's aim for that is uh not just to summon krakens which can which we're told a couple of times in Fire and Blood. This is George R. R. Martin, I am sure, giving us little bit strips of information. Um, blood in the water summons them. I suspect that Joran is aware of that. But also he is timing this for the same time he's got spies, I think, over in, or a spy over in Victarian's camp. So he is timing this for, to happen at the same time as Victarian is there with the battle over um in Mirene and the blowing of the hellhorn to try and capture a dragon euron is trying to create as much magic at, as he can at this one time he's got his unborn child uh strapped to the front of his boat he's got priests from and, and wizards from many faiths and nuns strapped to other uh ships he is wanting to cause death and destruction he is wanting every magic user to be crying out and trying to do whatever they can magic wise euron when we talk about his plan euron's plan is to create chaos and to destroy the world and then become god of the ashes that is what he is about so that he is trying to just um uh, kill as many people as possible, cause as much carnage as possible, um, uh, summon and harness as many huge and nasty gribblies as he possibly can. That's his idea. The battle for Old Town will be a second and separate battle when he literally tries to invade Old Town, in my view. Uh, Demps saying, currently reading Storm of Swords. How do you think Tyrion's story will end at the end of A Song of Ice and Fire? I think he will survive. Um, I think he will get through. I think there's a, a fair to medium chance that he will um, he will end up Hand of the King to Bran. Now, you always have to remember with this, George R. R. Martin was trying was originally thinking of having a trilogy. So you have to place greater weight on the connections and symbolism that he creates in book one than in later books, because he thought you know, everything's very condensed. And Tyrion's connections are fascinating because he and John made a really close bond. And I mean, they shake hands and call each other friends before they depart. They're, that's a really strong bond. Him and Bran also do. And we're at a time when the Starks are against the Lannisters and Tyrion himself has been captured by Cat um, and uh, 
Ned down in King's Landing is being attacked by Jamie Lannister because of this. Up in Winterfell, Bran is there thanking Tyrion for this saddle that he's had designed for him. The connection between Bran and Tyrion is a strong one, and I think that will come back at, at the end of the story as well. Uh, cloaked one saying for crafty spirit thank you cloaked one i love it again when people pick up questions for other people um if you were to compare varis and littlefinger in their approach to influence high politics who do you reckon played the better game um i don't know about i mean this is a tough one because they've got completely different styles varis has got a very clear long-term plan that he's been building on for a very long time littlefinger creates chaos and then tries to think quickly about how can i use this chaos so they've got very very different styles i think what we will see is both of them will rise to great heights and then crash and burn over the course of the next one and a half books so uh, who played the best game on their own terms both of them probably did varus will succeed in doing what he intended to do which is to get the person that he has had trained up to be a king on the throne and loved by the people but that is um as far as he's going to go danny's then going to arrive the the others are going to appear from the north the whole thing is just going to come collapsing down around his ears um little finger I think he he's still working on what he wants to do, changing it, figuring it out as he goes through this. Um, Sansa, we sometimes act as if Littlefinger's plan has always been about weird things towards Sansa, but it's very noticeable in the books when Littlefinger first meets her, which is at the tourney of the hand in King's Landing, he stumbles over his words. He uh, just... Uh, says a couple of things, strokes her cheek in a really creepy way, says, wow, you're just like your mother. Then he walks off without saying goodbye. It's really weird, and it's very clear that that's the moment at which it's like, okay, so maybe I can't have cat, but uh, the Sansa. <laughs> so that is, I mean, it's weird and creepy, but that seems to be halfway through book one. That's where his thinking started to shift. Um, uh, Andrew K saying Dominican stud mentioned their super chat was missed before. Not sure if you got to that one since they mentioned it. Um, if if I have meant if I have missed it, uh, could one of the mods put it down in the chat now? If you can find it, that would be fantastic. Um, uh, I, I sorry for missing uh, super chats. It does uh, it does sometimes happen when when the chat is moving quickly as it is today, uh, which is fantastic. And I love picking up as many uh, different questions as I possibly can. Um, do, 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 do. I'm just trying to see. I want to make sure I haven't missed any other super chats here as I am going through. Okay, uh, Kelly Johnson, do you think the Ashford Tourney theory is valid? Um, I'm assuming that you mean that when you say the Ashford Tourney th uh, theory um, is the Ashford Tourney was the one in the first Duncan Egg story, and the only. Th theory i've heard about that one is the one that the um the knights who were the five champions there represent sansa's love interest um i i did a video on this a long time ago um and so i'm now struggling to remember what i said but i think the answer was no the the main reason for why that might be B was because yes you have a um a, a lannister and then you also have swift um which seems like an odd combination of people but i think um i think the answer is no please do go and check out my video if you want more details on that one because i i can remember i had a very clear view on it um uh, I, off the top of my head i can't remember the exact uh, reasoning behind it andrew k have you seen the graham mctavish casting yes so there is um, uh, allegedly, not been formally confirmed, Graham McTavish, who um, is a veteran from 
a lot of uh, good shows like uh, I think it was Outlander and a couple of other things. Um, uh, could he be Lionel Strong or Harold Westerling? Um, he is a very, um, he's sort of older, but very strong character uh, as an actor, what he often portrays. Um, yes, someone someone like Lionel Strong, probably. I'm, I'm happy to wait for them to tell... Uh, uh, to tell us who that is. Andrew K. Ah, oh, here's the Mr. Super Chat from Dominican Stud. If you could give Rob Stark a piece of advice that he would listen to, what would you tell him? Uh, I, I, I mean, it's it's hard to say because, I mean, the obvious thing is um, don't trust uh, don't, don't trust um, the uh, You know when you're doing a uh, do, doing a, a live stream and you just completely forget the name of a house, um, you know it's exactly uh, the red wedding. Uh, the, but don't go there. I, I think the short answer is I would probably say um, be be bold but be sensible. I think that's all you can do. A, a lot of it was inevitable. He was basically he was outmaneuvered by Tywin Lannister, not on the field of battle, but in politics. And uh, it was that was the problem he had. He had to make sure that he kept his allies close. Um, so uh, I mean, I think that's probably the advice. I mean. It's hard. I, th I think the, the thing, the, the way that George R. R. Martin writes is that he writes tragedy in the best possible sense, in that when you go back through the characters and their character arcs, it always seems inevitable based on who they are and what they've done. Um, he uh, His fate was largely sealed from the get-go. He I, I feel on my reread, I feel a lot more sympathy for his character than I did before. Perhaps because he didn't have a POV chapter before uh, at all. And, and so we never actually see inside his head. George R. R. Martin said that if he could, he probably would have changed that. Uh, so we never see inside his head. But he is scared. It's really, really clear he's scared. We see from a couple of Bran chapters that he's there uh, and he's trying to reassure Bran. But then you get like this sort of sad line at the end of it. And the, you know, he hugged Bran and Bran could hear that R Rob was crying. And it's like he's he's been thrust he's 15 and he's been thrust into this time when he needs to decide as of people here to die uh what am i going to do and and he's following his mother's advice which is not always the best advice um uh Ajninomi saying, how many species can skin change? Children of the forest and humans can. Uh, giants with mammoths can die wolves. That explains John's weird Hulk strength and hearing puppy ghost. Um, I don't mean I don't think so, but there's no reason why not. The Clearly the, um, uh, the children of the forest seem to have through the sort of the green seer skills seem to be able to do this and that is definitely a case for humans as well we have no evidence of other races doing this is the short answer to this so we do not know we can't possibly say uh, and there aren't many uh, giants or whatever else around so uh, and we're told that you know it's one in a thousand thousand that can be a green seer yes skin changes are perhaps one in a thousand for humans in the north of the first uh, first men blood but um to be a proper green seer would be a thousand a thousand there's a lot fewer giants than uh, a thousand um Dominican stud saying, I would tell him not to marry the Westerling girl. I mean, I think that's probably as as, uh, as sensible advice as anyone could uh, give the phrase everybody's pointing out. Yes, absolutely. Uh, complete mind blank. Apologies uh, for that. Um, Cloaked one, again, picking up for something for someone else. Thank you. For Green Dragon, what do you think of the theory that Danny is the daughter of King Eris and Ashara 
Dane because her name is Dane and Eris, and Stormborn means baseborn like Edric Storm. Um, I mean, I like. I like that logic, I have to say. It's, it's good logic. George R. R. Martin definitely likes doing word games like that. Uh, but no, we're, we're pretty clear that um, Ashara Dane was not around at that time. We know when Daenerys was born. We know um, who her mother is. Um, and... And th there are witnesses to this. It's not just like we're we're just asserting this from from nowhere. Uh, Viserys was there. He was six, but he was certainly old enough to to know his mother was pregnant. Um, and uh, we know that Daenerys was born eight to nine months after John, and we know that that puts it at the point at which uh, Aerys um, effectively raped Danny's mother, um, his wife. So, um, yes, that all stacks up. So I don't see, I don't see a need for that, a plot need for it. And it doesn't seem to fit in with what we know about uh, Ashara Dane, who was definitely down at the Tower of Joy uh, at the end of all of this. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't like it. It's the short answer. Uh, I, I like, I, I like the um, Dane heiress thing. I, that that's nice, but I, I don't think um, overall it works. Um, question from uh, Deborah Pollard saying, hi, Robert, you are just the best. Thank you very much. Uh, better than TV. Wow. High praise. Thank you. Uh, I enjoy your content so much, and I'm rereading A Song of Ice and Fire again, looking for the details you talk about in your videos. The added depth you bring to these stories is unparalleled. Thank you. That's a really kind thing to say. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And if I inspire people to read the books, then I feel job done. Um, and Matt Forty. Uh, Magic has a cost. What do you think the others have to sacrifice for their ability to control the dead, if anything? Now, I, yeah, it, magic does have a cost, but I think this is... Um, their ability to control the dead is not so much a, um, a magical spell that is cast, which has a cost as an ab ability to do a thing. Now, oh, let me explain what I mean by that. So skin changing, which we were talking about a moment ago, being able to walk into something, does that have a cost? Well, we see it happen lots and lots of times in A Song of Ice and Fire, um, particularly, say, uh, Bran does this a lot. He skin changes into Summer, he skin changes into Hodor. Does that have a cost on him, perhaps? But he certainly doesn't seem to need to make you know, to sacrifice a person and, and all the rest of it in order for that to work. So that is part of the Green Seer ability. Now, my take is that the others have got a sort of a twisted alternate version of this. So whereas uh, Bran... For example, as a token green seer, he can take over, as the same with Varamir Sixkins and many of the other Starks, incidentally, and others, can take over live animals and people and control them. The others can do that with dead animals and people. So that seems to be, as, as far as my current best understanding is, that seems to be what it is. So it's not that they're casting a spell, it's just that they've got a slightly twisted undead version of what, say, the Starks have. Now, that's important because if you take a version of what the show 
did uh, as being true, that the others, the White Walkers, were created by taking a human and then performing some magic on it. If that human already had the ability to do um, this walking into things, you take the... and then you make them undead, that's the wrong word, but let's go with it for the moment because it's easy enough to understand. If you make them undead and they retain that ability to do it, they then get the ability to do it not for the living, but for the dead. Now, uh, this adds one other final thing, think point that we have to all of this, which is that I think George R. R. Martin, if we, if that is all true, then I think George R. R. Martin will start to just prod us with this question of where actually, what's actually worse, reanimating the dead to get them to do your will or jumping in and taking over the control of something living. Bran, we often think of being as one of the good guys, but what he's doing is clear. Hodor does not like him coming in, shoving him into a corner of his own mind and taking control of him and literally just using his body however it is. There, I mean, you could use quite strong and graphic language to describe what Bran is doing to Hodor there, but he's literally muscling in to a live human, pushing him outside, taking control of his body and doing whatever he wants with it. I suspect that George R. R. Martin may well just go, so where's who's, who's the good guy here? Who's who's the person who's doing the worst? It's the person who's reanimating a dead body or the person who's taking control over a living human? Um, question from uh, Cloaked One. Again, thank you, Cloaked One, picking up for Chelsea Oliver this time. What do you think of my theory that the Martells could know John's true lineage? If so, could they align themselves with him if Fagon dies. I think I think they do, or at least they know a lot more than perhaps they're letting on. The the logic behind this is the fact that you get the Tower of Joy was not a secret. This is a thing that we we're sort of uh, often uh, unconsciously thinking that this was hidden away somewhere, nobody knew where it was. It wasn't that much of a secret. Already we've got three members of the King's Guard who were there, plus Rhaegar, plus Lyanna. So we've got five people who were there already. The members of the King's Guard may well have had other people with them. This was a tower um, on the Prince's Pass, which was the main highway between dawn and the rest of the seven kingdoms the there are house fowler control that they patrol it in times of war this was at a time of war they will have been especially taking care of who is coming and going if somebody took over one of their watchtowers they would have been aware of it because they stayed there a long time. This wasn't just like they were just there for a couple of weeks. They were there for months. And House Fowler will have known about it. They almost certainly will have told House Martell. House Martell notably were not against Rhaegar. They were, they, they were against Eris, but they were not against Rhaegar. And... All of the hints are that they were in constant communication. So um, because, of course, Rhaegar was married to Elia, and if he wanted to take on um, an, an extra wife or if he wished to divorce Elia and remarry, whatever the situation was, the Martells would have had to have been involved in knowing about that and sort of okaying it in some way. And... The Martells, although we might think uh, that they would be against the Targaryens as a whole, their entire game since Robert's Rebellion has been trying to get the Targaryens back into power. They were not anti-Targaryen, they were just anti heiress They actually liked Rhaegar. And so, but in terms of it being a secret or not, uh, then you add in the fact that 
if there was a baby being born, there is no way on this planet that Rhaegar would have uh, allowed that to happen without a maester or someone medical or knowledgeable there, wet nurse or whatever, added to which we've almost certainly got that it would need to be uh, provisioned. They were there for months. Probably that came from House Dane. Before you know it, you've got a whole range of people who understood where this was. It was a secret only from Robert Baratheon, because Robert Baratheon was the one who would come in and um, do things they did not like. It was not a secret in the people who were in Rhaegar's circle. Uh, so in the second part of that, could they align themselves with John if Fagon dies? Uh, quite possibly they could, yes. I, I think the thing is that they wouldn't necessarily know that John is um, the child that was born there. I think that they would not necessarily know that at all because Ned basically he just got rid of all evidence and went and hurried away. Um, Mark Adams, thank you so much uh, for the super sticker. Uh, Jay Kelsey 55 saying, Hi, Robert, do you think Lemon Gate matters to the plot or is George R. R. Martin just messing with us? By Lemon Gate, I assume you're meaning um, the, uh, the, the, the lemon tree, uh, the house with the red draw, door and the lemon tree, where Danny, this is Danny's home when she was a child when she was young and um she distinctly remembers the lemon tree growing outside her window and some people have said hey lemon trees don't grow in bravos we thought she was in bravos and then come up with large theories about where else she might have been again i've done a whole video on it if you're interested in the detail but the short answer is that most of these theories only do the first half of the sentence uh that um but trees do not grow in Bravos. Uh, the second half of the sentence is, except in the courts of the uh, the rich and the powerful, meaning that they do grow in the courts of the rich and the powerful. So there's absolutely no reason why um, that can't have been Bravos. Will it be? Will it matter to the plot? It matters uh, in as much as it shows that uh, Dawn has been in the plotting to be getting Targaryens back onto the throne for a very long time, and it will probably also play into the Bravos political subplot that we may or may not actually get much detail on, but how Bravos positions itself politically is going to be important. It has stayed out of the huge wars going on in Westeros. It stayed out of uh, the fact that there appears to be um, a Targaryen with dragons gathering power in southeast Essos. It has stayed out of all of this, but there, there are we see through Arya's chapters there seems to be some political movement and Perhaps the Sea Lord will change, and if the Sea Lord changes, Bravos's situation may well change, and they may well get involved. And as we've already noted, they can build a war galley every day. Give them a couple of months, they've got a fleet. And, and that is going to be really important, because then what do they do with that fleet? Whose side are they going to come on? Um, Roman Lakovet saying, by the way, have you seen the 1993 outline of the first book? It's fascinating to see how the story developed. Uh, if you mean the, uh, there was ages ago, we, we had a picture of what George R. R. Martin sent to his editor when he was uh, pitching the book and he did an outline of what was going to happen. And it is completely different <laughs> to what we have now. There, there's a whole load of, um, I think there, there's a, a John and Aya love story. There's, I mean, there's the, the cat dies north of the wall. There's, there's uh, the whole story seems very different. Now, um, yes, it's fascinating to see how much this has changed. I think the intriguing thing is how much changed between that and him writing the first or finishing the first book, because that will impl that will suggest some of the foreshadowing that he built in in the first book, maybe for things that didn't actually happen. 
Uh, question from... Mm -mm 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 -mm. I have another... Hang on, apologies for the... I'm, I'm just scrolling through the chat. There's been a lot of uh, questions today. Adrian Birchall, have you seen the trailer for The Green Knight? Yes, I have. It looks amazing. Uh, the Green Knight, for those who don't know, this is... The Green, Green Knight is it? excellent ancient uh, myth slash tale uh, in from Arthurian times and they made a, a film of it that was due to come out last year this is one of those ones and they just held it back waiting it is now going to come out I think in July maybe June uh, with Dev Patel in the lead looks fantastic really to really moody so uh, yeah I've been thinking what's the I've not been to the, the cinema for, I don't know, 18 months. Uh, what's going to be the first film to tempt me back uh, when the world is a little bit safer? Um, it, it, it could be that. Uh, it could well be that. Yes, it looks uh, amazing. Uh, do on my Twitter, if you're interested, you can just hunt for In Deep Geek. Then I've got a link across to uh, the trailer. Um, Cloaked one um, for Kira Visniovic. Cieka. Apologies, that looks like it's a Polish name and always mangle Polish names. Uh, so apologies, but uh, Kira, could Tyrion design a special saddle for Bran to be a build-up for Tyrion design? Could Tyrion, sorry, could Tyrion designing a special saddle for Bran be a build-up for Tyrion designing a dragon saddle for Danny? According to Fire and Blood, Targs were use, uh, using them for fighting on dragons. Yeah, he could. Um, this is something that... Uh, did come out from fire and blood that they had they attached themselves to dragons with you know, i don't, don't know if they used the word saddle but that's very much the idea with chains and one other thing we know is that Tyrion is an expert on dragons and again this is one of those bits of is Tyrion a targaryen he knows a lot about dragons. He's read lots of books about dragons. And when he's on the Shy Maid, one of the things that he does when he's heading down the River Rhoyne is he writes all of his knowledge about dragons down in a book. Now, this book will probably end up, um, I mean, I think he left it on the boat. So young Griff will have it, Fagon will have it, but his knowledge is still up here. And yes, it's entirely possible that if Danny comes back and is like, I don't really know how to control Drogon, then, but she's got this hellhorn, maybe that might help. Tyrion is probably the person who's going to give her the greatest bits of information about how to actually do this. So that could well be the way that he gets himself into her good graces, not by, I mean, on the show, it was that you know, he managed the city in her absence with Varys. Um, but here, perhaps in the books, perhaps it will be that it's his knowledge of dragons, which is going to be, and yeah, I think the saddle thing is a really, uh, really good point. Um, Ricky McCulloch, did the full spring shenanigans, Blood Raven, compromise the heart of winter in some way and trigger the others? Why did they move when they did? So the full spring um, was the uh, the year of the tourney at Harren Hall. There had been winter for two, three years, and then suddenly everyone thought it was spring. The maesters said, it's spring again. And they that's why the Tony at Harren Hall happened because suddenly it's nice and sunny and all the rest of it. And lots of things happened at the Tony at Harren Hall, obviously, including Rhaegar meeting Lyanna and all of and all the rest of it. Uh, but um imme immediately or very soon afterwards, suddenly the weather went back to winter again, and not just like and there was a little bit more snow. This was properly winter. The, all the way down to King's Landing, huge icicles hang, hanging from the crenellations of King's Landing, the, the river freezing, the black water freezing. Um, this was really, really bad 
a, a snow and winter. And the clear implication is that this was something, it was called the year of the fall spring because it was so shocking. People were not expecting it. This was not normal. And the clear implication is that this was probably magic from the the Weirwood Network, Blood Raven, who were wanting to create the environment that would allow the prince that was promised to be created. Wait, and we know, and or Blood Raven's understanding of who the prince that was promised was, should be, which is from House Targaryen and House Stark. So that seems to have been what was going on there. In terms of the question of whether this might have roused the others, I don't think so. The others seem to have been around for a bit longer than that. The implication of the um, uh, what's uh, what's been going on north of the wall and the stories that we get there and the sacrifices that we that have been going on there from Craster is that that they've been moving for maybe forty years, something like that. May, they may even be moving for longer than that. So no, this was not the tourney at Harren Hall and the year of the fall spring which prompted them. This was that was a reaction to that movement because Blood Raven being situated uh, up in his cave to the north will definitely be aware of their movements. Um, Ryan Larkin, thank you so much for the super chat. I didn't see a question attached to the, that. Um, uh, Richard Ramirez saying, Robert, you are wrong, mate. Uh, I often am I'm not sure what I was wrong about, but um, I happily hold my hands up to say that I get some stuff wrong. Um, and I think, is that now caught up? Oh, Glenn Thrasher, thank you so much for the super sticker. Uh, uh, Lexky1 saying, this is my first live chat. I really enjoyed it. Love reading all your comments. Yeah, it's a complete, first of all, welcome to if this is your first live stream. Uh, it is a completely different experience watching these uh, live than just watching them uh, later on. And uh, I think that's me caught up on the super chat. So let me get into um, my questions. This is already looking like it's going to be a long live stream. Uh, I've barely started my patron questions, but here we go. Uh, keep keep the, the questions coming in the chat. I will try and um, uh, get back into the, as many as I can. Um, uh, David Bird, welcome to your first live stream as well. Um, Launduck20. Hi, Robert. Do you think Ulthos is another continent? I find it interesting that there is barely anything written about it. Ulthos, for those who don't know, is an area of land which is sort of south of a shy across the water. Um, it may well be, but what George R. R. Martin has said quite interestingly is that he has left that deliberately vague. He has deliberately not added to the map to show whether it's just an island or a continent or what, because this is a Westeros-centric world that he's created, or story, I should say, that he's created in terms of the people we're seeing this through their eyes come from Westeros. And he, wanted, he did this deliberately because he wanted to show that they just do not know about the wider world. Their understanding of the world, particularly if you read things like The World of Ice and Fire, uh, the bits about Westeros, huge amounts of history, lots known about it. When you get to the free cities, yes, we, we know a reasonable amount. The further east you get, the vaguer it gets. You get to Yt, which we're told this was the earliest civilization. This was they had they were advanced beyond anyone else. But you know, we only get a few pages on them. There's not huge amounts of information. A shy, we just get rumors as much as anything else, and the rest of it is just very very limited. And this is deliberate from George R. R. Martin to try and show us the limitations of understanding of the people through whose eyes we are uh, reading this story. 
Uh, Turgo in Time Lord saying, hello, Robert and Dan. That's Dan, my dog. Um, after my third listen through the audiobooks, I'm curious about your thoughts on Robert Aaron. In the eerie, he is tormented by singing, seemingly explained away as the condemned bard. However, I'm not convinced he would be audible locked in a sky cell. If Robin possibly also has some green seer abilities, might the latent spirits of the children of the Weirwood throne be reaching out for him in a sort of body snatcher's sense? Okay, so um there is a weirwood throne in the eerie which uh has and robert aaron clearly is disturbed by something which has led to some theories that perhaps he's being uh called out to by the green seers in some way perhaps the same way bran was um now that theory may have some merit i've not gone into it in huge detail myself but i think what i would say is that in terms of the singing that he hears i think that there is a very human and i think this is great writing uh, the, a very human bit of reasoning behind it if we take the story of what we have you have marillion who's this singer he uh, he comes across originally with uh, with cat when Cat captures Tyrion and he comes across with her, ends up in the Eyrie, and he, he kind of stays there. Now, when we get one of the big moments in the Eyrie, Littlefinger pushes Lysa Aran out through the moon door, and in the room is Sansa and Marillion. And he's had Marillion in there because he wants him to be playing songs so that people outside can't hear whatever kerfuffle's happening. Oh, so clever, little finger. So what he then does is he blames Marillion. He says he pushed Lysa Aaron out through the moon door. So he blames him. And basically, he then makes sure that he gets tortured. He gets put in the sky cells. Uh, his eyes are gouged out, his fingers are broken, all sorts of horrible things happen to him. But while he's in the sky cells, in order to keep his spirits up, Marillion sings songs. Now, people claim that they can hear this. They may be able to, uh, just bits and pieces here. Um, what is important is that he is rumoured to have died, um, effectively. Um, he admits to the crime he did not commit, um, and basically he's almost certainly pushed out or jumps from the sky cells. Now, even after that, Robert Aaron hears this singing, but it's not just him, it's also Sansa. Now, it stops. Robert Aaron does not complain about the singing when Sansa hugs him to sleep. And I think that the very human explanation for this is that Robert Aaron has been told his mother, and let's not forget his mother has made sure that Robert Aaron is completely, uh, completely dependent on her. He has been told that his mother's murderer is there in the sky cells and said that's all he hears is this singing and it's resounding around his mind it's the same with sansa sansa has been placed in this incredibly traumatic situation where she is being forced to lie about who killed her aunt and she does this but something you know, in her conscience keeps the sort of the singing from marillion there sort of almost condemning her for what she's done and it's when Robert Aaron does not feel, does not hear this when he has comfort from someone, when people are not just treating him as this sort of little lordling, but actually when he gets human comfort from someone, that's when the singing stops. So I think for me, this is actually really well-written trauma, human trauma, human drama. I don't think this is taking it to the extra level of magic maybe there is a level there that i just haven't uh, investigated yet but i think at a basic level we're definitely talking about this uh, robert aaron uh, just working through the trauma of the fact that he thinks his mother is being killed by this singer 
Uh, Lyle Hammack saying, hi, Robert, this is off topic, um, but do you think Sauron was behind the Great Plague, which came from the East? It certainly helped him and hurt his enemies. And do you see an echo in the Great Plague ravaging King's Landing? Uh, yeah, well, not much is off topic on um, uh, open Q&A. Um, this is a Lord of the Rings question initially, obviously. The Great Plague, the Great Plague happened in the Third Age. Uh, so for those who are not 100% uh, up to speed on their Lord of the Rings history, so we have the, after Sauron, uh, if you if you remember that first scene in the Lord of the Rings movies when Sauron, he had the ring cut from his finger and then the ring obviously ends up uh, being lost in the river and eventually Gollum gets it, but after the ring is cut from his finger, then he sort of, Sauron disappears for a thousand years or so before slowly regaining his strength in Southern Mirkwood. While he is regaining his strength slowly in Southern Mirkwood, the Witch King of Angmar, the head of the Black Riders of the Nazgul, is just m massively pushing forward uh, the enemy's agenda. He sets up a kingdom in the north, Angmar, uh, and he takes on the northern, the two great kingdoms of humanity. Uh, there was Gondor in the south and Arnor in the north. Uh, and then he, over centuries, slowly breaks down and destroys the kingdom in the north, which had itself broken down a little bit before that, but he destroys them all. But he is hugely helped by the fact that there's this great plague which kills off a whole load of people uh, in the uh, what was left of the kingdom of Arnor before he does his final push. So that's the history uh, there. You asked whether Sauron is behind it. I think actually probably more likely to be the Witch King who was behind it, if anyone. But um, my general take is probably this was just a plague. Sometimes plagues do happen and the Witch King made use of it rather than caused it. Um, that would be my general take there. Um, is there a link across when we're talking Game of Thrones? Um, uh, is there an echo to the Grey Plague ravaging King's Landing? Well, a bit. I think George R. R. Martin, though, is taking um, more inspiration from real life. My take is, and, and we'll see whether it happens, this is just a gut instinct thing. I don't think it's tinfoil, but it, the way that George R. R. Martin has written King's Landing to be like London in many, many ways, and one of the big moments in London's history was the fact that there was the plague, the Great Plague, the year 1665, and that ravaged its way through the city. Then 1666, the next year, the Great Fire of London ravaged its way through the city, and the Great Fire actually got rid of a lot of the plague. So uh, it was terrible, but also had a sort of a weird upside to it as well. I think that is what he's taking his inspiration for, for the likely plague and then fire in King's Landing, which is uh, going to come up. Um, question from Cloaked One. This is for Will Foran. Thank you, Cloaked One and uh, Will Foran. Do you foresee a magical ending to Euron or a dragon fight with John? Yeah, I... I foresee he, uh, I'm just trying to work out, I was laughing as to whether I would I would go as far as doing a prediction. I, th I want to see, and I think that there are clear hints that this may happen, a fight between Jon and uh, Euron on Dragonback over the God's Eye Lake. There are clear echoes in the uh, to the dance of the dragons where we had a fight between Aemond one eye we obviously have Euron um, uh, has one eye uh, and Daemon Targaryen um, and they fight on dragons over the god's eye lake and basically everyone dies 
And I have a feeling that may well be what happens in the books, because I think that Euron will get a dragon. The Night King will not get a dragon. I mean, whether the Night King exists as a character within A Song of Ice and Fire more than just a legend is, com is a completely different matter. But the showrunners of Game of Thrones were very clear that they made up they completely wrote this wasn't something from George R. R. Martin. That whole episode beyond the wall, where the night uh, night king got uh, the dragon, uh, they did that because they wanted to have a way for him to get past the wall. Now, there's lots of further implications of that, but the the main implication is that in the books, the night king does not get the dragon. I don't think that Danny is going to have all three dragons all the way through this. I think that John will ride one of them, Rhaegal, and I think that the other one will end up with Euron. So that's my general take, and I think that there will be a fight between the two of them. Um, Brian Sheeran saying, do you think Arya will give the gift of death to Lady Stoneheart, or what will be her end, in your opinion? She may do. She may well do. I think Lady Stoneheart's character end has to come when she feels that she has wreaked, wreaked revenge for the damage done to her family. And that will come when a certain set of events happen. The first is that she will discover that her... Her, well, the first is that she will take revenge on House Frey. And I think that what we saw Arya do on the show, I think is probably more likely to be Lady Stoneheart in terms of a, taking on uh, the twins and destroying as many Freys as possible. I think that's going to be Lady Stoneheart. And the second part of this is actually discovering that the, the children that she thought were dead or missing are okay. Um or were not actually killed in the ways that she thinks they were. So Bran and Rickon, she thinks are dead. She thinks that Theon killed them. That's not true. Rickon will die a little bit later, I suspect, but that was not a wrong done to them in the end. Um, and Arya and Sansa are both safe. When she discovers that Sansa is safe and Arya is safe and uh, Bran and Rickon were not killed in that way and she has taken revenge for the death of Rob. That is all of her children's deaths avenged. And that's the point at which her end may come. Now, what Beric did was effectively, he reached the point, Beric Dondarrion, this is he reached the point when he achieved the things and he didn't want to carry on anymore. And I think that that's where Lady Stoneheart is going to get to. Might Arya um, kill her effectively to put her out of the misery? quite possible this is a way that this could definitely happen um because it's no longer her mother um and uh, n3 sgis saying sorry if this has been asked what would happen if the white walkers destroyed westeros would they try to move on to the rest of the world? Yes, almost certainly. I mean, I don't think they would be able to get across. They wouldn't like get on boats and go across. But there are clear implications. We know Planetos is a globe, and there are clear implications in the first long night that they also attacked down into Essos uh, from the north, from the northeast, from the way that we look at the map, and they will probably do the same. Um, so it's not a matter of um starting on westeros and then moving elsewhere i think we're going to see that they attack in both places at the same time um lady pushkins in the show the scepter that marries rob and talisa is the same scepter that marries Rhaegar and liana do you think this is relevant i.e a witness to the event or just a casting thing um i think it's just a casting thing i think that that was um uh, I mean, not coincidence, but I think if you try, I mean, this is very much a show thing rather than the book thing, but if you try to put yourself back in the mindset of the showrunners back at the end of season seven, and they had what is the biggest secret of 
uh, A Song of Ice and Fire. uh, Rhaegar and Lyanna got together. John is their child. The R plus L equals J. This is this was the big thing that people for literally decades have been debating, and everyone thinks they know the answer, um, and they were going to reveal it in the the final moments of the penultimate season, and they uh, will have want to keep that secret. This was the biggest show on the planet. Uh, they had what looked like just three people on uh, actors on set, so it makes complete sense to me that they chose somebody who they knew that they could trust, who'd been involved in it before, who they thought, well, most people won't even notice that it's the same. But I mean, I certainly didn't notice it was the same uh, actor. So th- it, that makes perfect sense, and it was just a coincidence, um, or not coincidence. I, I don't think it was plot significant. Um, and funny also say um, I always get the feeling that some underrated characters know more in inverted commas know more than they let on I assume George R. R. Martin does this on purpose J. R. Mormont for instance giving John his family's Valyrian steel sword seems a big gesture I know John saved his life but it feels more than that what do you think and who else do you think this uh, fits uh, this bill um, so yeah, I don't think J.R. Mormont necessarily knew more. I think that it, he felt that he was now a member of the Night's Watch. And whereas he had left his sword to the family, the family then effectively given it back to him because it's that Jora then did give it back to her. He, he decided effectively that he wasn't worthy of the sword and so gave it back to his father. And so what does Jay or Mormont then do? He could hand it back to the family, um, but he seems to keep hold of it. And then he sees something in John and gifts it to him as the, as an alternate. He literally saved his life, this ultimate presence. So I think perhaps it had more significance than he knew at the time, but he already had his eye on John for great things. I, he already was training him up to be his successor as Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. This is why he made him his steward. That we're told this very clearly that this is why he made him a steward because he saw the potential in John to be uh, the next Lord Commander and so what seems to have happened is that he if we want to look at it in terms of honour saw the sword as needing to keep its honour and decided therefore to give it on to what he was hoping would be the next Lord Commander of the Night's Watch and that is where he saw it going. In terms of other characters who know more Sir Barristan is the one that always gets me. I think I said it earlier in the stream, but the amount of times he starts a sentence that says like, oh yes, and of course, Rhaegar when he was alive, and and then Danny interrupts him or something else happens. He always gets halfway into a thought about something really interesting and then gets cut off. He does know more. Um, he may not know the significance of all he knows, but he does know more. Um, question from uh, Sean Abbas thank you very much saying do you think we are seeing a time loop in A Song of Ice and Fire where we're seeing a replay of the Great Empire myth begin again sort of like Ouroboros's uh, head starting uh, time over so these are the worm, worm Ouroboros that um, is eating its own tail the idea that time goes in a circle. Um, I'll be seeing it happen again. I don't think we're seeing time happen again. George R. R. Martin seems to be of the view within the world of Ice and Fire that time echoes, that stories echo, that truths echo. They don't repeat themselves. So we're not seeing the same thing happen again. What we are seeing are... um, things that have happened before be echoed again in real life. So you get Tyrion, who is an echo of 
Nan the Clever. Uh, we get echoes of the story of the Rat Cook coming up. We get lots of these echoes from legends that move down into uh into what the story that we have today i think we'll see a lot of echoes from a dance the dragons that get come again there's lots of echoes from uh, aegon's invasion that perhaps coming up with with danny with her three dragons with uh, drogon being an echo of beleriand that there, there, there are echoes through this we're not however seeing time repeating itself per se i don't think we're in a time loop um, we're, we're just in a uh, seeing things that have happened previously in different ways, um, uh, being sort of uh, shadows um, uh, happening one more time. Um, Question from Bryce Chapman. I started rereading book one after about 10 years of being a show only person. Um, Excellent. I'm glad you're rereading the books. Uh, you mentioned in a live stream last year that you were struck by the political savvy cat displays in the first few chapters, and I noticed the same thing. But then I remembered, isn't she about to arrest Tyrion at the Crossroads Inn? In the show, at least, this plays as a very short-sighted and impulsive move. Help me remember, does this go down differently in the books? If not, how do we square this apparent contradiction in Kat's character? Well, uh, so it goes down the same way in the books, is the, the, the short version of this. But I think that we can, we can square this relatively easily. That Kat, uh, and what I said, her political acumen initially is very obvious compared to everything else in the North. Um, they don't really understand anything about how things happen in King's Landing. And so Kat's political acumen is an understanding of how the South operates. The thing that struck me most, though, was her intelligence. Now, this is her figuring out stuff. She figures out that Bran must have seen something and probably been pushed by a Lannister from um, the, the old tower, and that is why he fell. She figures that out. The other person who figures that out is Tyrion. They're the only people who seem to figure that out. Then uh, she uh, persuades everybody that she's heading north from the end of the cross after capturing Tyrion. She's heading north, but in fact she heads east. Tyrion, we actually see him think she that she is uh, she has outthought me um and uh this is a rare thing for Tyrion. so we see that she is clever that comes through again and again and again in the eerie when you get uh, the whole um i think Brendan uh, Tully calls it, Blackfish calls it a mummer's farce of what's going on uh, with uh, Tyrion uh, and his trial and all the rest of it. She sees through this straight away. She understands that the, what's going on and, and she's alone there seems to be thinking, well, actually, Bronn may well win this. Uh, I say alone. Uh, Blackfish is and... and um, uh, so Rodrick also do, but they're not people there in the Eyrie. Um, she figures this stuff out. So her intelligence is clear. She is very clever. However, she also, as another part of her character, makes rash decisions or quick decisions that are understandable based on love of her family, um, but are what we might today call above her pay grade to decide. By what I mean, uh, but I mean by that that um, capturing Tyrion, it's completely understandable. She was actually not trying to; uh, she was to get Tyrion's uh, attention. She was uh, hiding away in a corner. She didn't want him to see her. It was only when Marillion, who we were talking about a moment ago, when he suddenly stood up and drew attention to the corner over there, that that's when Tyrion spotted her. And then she thought quickly about what she's going to do about this that situation. Um, but her capturing 
Tyrion had huge implications. It led to Jaime attacking Ned down in King's Landing, Ned then doing this lie, this bluff, that he had ordered Cat to do this, uh, which, digression, but this is another indication of where Ned is at as well. He, he is willing to lie. He is willing to lie to people in order to save his family. He is trying to save Cat. He is trying to protect Cat by lying and so, and putting himself in danger and this happens this is happens again later when he lies about his own actions in order to save his children on this is on Varys's urging um and also obviously happened at the tower of joy a willingness to lie to people to make himself look bad in order to protect his family the people that he loves but that's a slight digression back to cat Cat made that rash decision. She also makes another rash decision when they're in the Eyrie and you get the Blackfish, the, the reports come. Tywin Lannister is amassing a, an, an army. They're going to march on River and the Blackfish says, uh, goes to Lysa Arryn and says, give me a thousand men and I will go and, and help protect our family over in uh, River Run. And Lysa Arryn says, no. And then he says, well, I'll just go on my own then if you're not going to give me anybody. At which point, Cat says, you can have a thousand Northmen, uh, which is not her decision to make. That's Ned's decision, because she is committing troops to what will be a war with the Lannisters. And that's Ned's decision to make as to whether to actually do that. But she makes that decision, uh, and literally on the spot, she hadn't thought about it at all, she makes that decision, and that is where we're at with her. It's that We square this circle by the fact that she's very clever, but she makes rash decisions based on a love for her family, and that was a, a desire to protect her family. Kelly Johnson, if the last green seer is the great other that created the others and Melisandre knows his name, why does she say it cannot be spoken? Well, the name that cannot be spoken is uh, sort of a fantasy trope about the big baddie. You think of Lord Voldemort, also it's the same in Gondor, they don't wish to speak Sauron's name and uh, many other um, fantasy stories as well. Um, I think the Great Other, it's worth noting that the Great Other only appears once as a phrase, uh, and it only ever, as a description, as an idea that there is this Great Other, only comes from Priests of R'hllor. This is their Manichaean worldview that there are two gods, there's the Great Other and there's R'hllor, and that is that is their worldview. So I don't think I would necessarily go along with this idea that the Great Other created the Others, um, and Melisandre, not saying his name, is is buying into this way that the fantasy worlds uh, tend to work. Roman Lakovets, uh, if Lady Stoneheart will deal with the phrase in the books, what's in store for Arya? There has to be a payoff for her training in Bravos, surely, absolutely. But in the books, then her list is a lot longer. And... Um, uh, it doesn't include the phrase, <laughs> incidentally. Um, so she stops adding to the list, really, when she gets to Bravos. Um, and so the phrase aren't added onto that list. Um, but the when she leaves Bravos, there will still be four or five names on it off the top of my head. Notable people include Cersei uh, and the Mountain and Sir Illyn Payne. Now, I suspect that it will it will be her who takes down at least one of them. So there will be a payoff to her doing that. But it's not uh, House Frey who, who does that. You look at um, Lady Stoneheart, her vengeance cycle is just largely about House Frey. Ayers is a much, much wider one. Uh, and much more focused in what happened in King's Landing. Uh, Kelly Johnson does Marillion deserve the frame uh, frames frame up set on him? Well, no. I mean, he's not a good character or a nice character, but he is framed for murder, and it was definitely not him who did it. Benjamin uh, Cormier, 
Thank you very much. Saying, considering you believe Blood Raven is responsible for everything that ever happened, slight exaggeration, but I'll take it. Do you believe Mormont was pushed by Blood Raven to favor John? I kid, of course. Thank you for everything you do. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, yeah, if in doubt, blame Blood Raven is my general view. Um, did he push the um, Mormont to? Uh, favor John. Um, I know you say you kid, of course, but I th that there is something on it in it. So, and the thing that's in it is Mormont's Raven. Now, um, I think that Blood Raven is clearly a very talented green seer and Borg, and there are very clear implication I implications of that the Mormont's Raven is. Um, spying and give, trying to give messages. Now, sometimes these messages are very, very clear. What it tends to do is pick a word and then repeat that word three times. And uh, what uh, you find sometimes it's very, very clear with Sam when they're at Craster's and uh, he's about to run off with Gilly, but the others are coming, then the raven is there and is just saying, run, run, run. Uh, and sometimes this is really clear. Um, others with John, for example, he repeats things like king, um, and he definitely shows affection for John, which is something that J.R. Mormont will have noted. So it, it is, is Blood did Blood Raven influence J.R. Mormont? Well, I think he already will have been um, noticing what John has been doing, and uh, he s will have seen that he provided leadership. I mean, in his early chapters in the um, uh, in the Night's Watch, or even before he joined the Night's Watch, he provided leadership for that bunch of new recruits. They followed him. They protected Sam. They stood up to Sir Alistair Thorne because he led them to it. So he showed leadership skills. He will have been aware of this. Obviously, he comes from the Starks, and there's this long um, uh, history of the Starks being in uh, the Night's Watch. And when you compare him to other new recruits, they tend to be either there because they've been sort of sent up, um, like there are various people who've been uh, sent up there by way of punishment, or they're criminals of some kind who've been sent up there um, uh, because, you know, where else do they go? So he is the the standout candidate. He didn't need much nudging, but I think, yes, perhaps through the Raven, there was a little bit of that going on. Um, Shlornduck20. Um, you mentioned last live stream that you don't think any of the dragons will survive, but what about the remaining direwolves? Uh, which ones do you see making it if any um so the dragons so i don't i don't think necessarily that all of the dragons um will die i think at least two of them will but i think what is definitely going to happen is the the threat from the dragons gets pushed back so um uh, what that means so the way that the show ended with two dragons dead and one flying off hopefully never to be seen again also works but the the theme of the story of ice and fire has to be that the threat from ice and the threat from fire are both pushed back uh, that may mean all of them dying it may not um the dire wolves which do i see making it um well well, let's go through. He died. Um, Lady has already died. Uh, that leaves um, Shaggy Dog, who I think will die relatively soon, certainly in the winds of winter. Ghost, I think, will 100% survive. Uh, 
excellent theory that I won't go into all of the details of it now, but I'll do a quick hat tip to Bookshelf Stud, who I think came up with it, um, that the very last scene is going to be John heading north and of the wall uh, at the end, like on the show, with Ghost and the direwolves calling out. There's a whole bit of... Uh, bit of logic to that uh, but uh, that I think implies that Ghost will survive the other ones Summer and Nymeria my feeling is that it's not plot necessary for either of them to survive so they may or they may not um, I think this is the kind of thing that George R. Martin when he talks about being a gardener writer he, he means that he will just see where the action's going, he will see where characters are, and he will see what makes sense when he gets to that point of the story. And I don't, pardon me, I don't think he has necessarily decided what happens to those two direwolves. Nymeria will definitely survive up to the end game, that much I'm pretty sure. Uh, Summer could die north of the wall as he did on the show, but I don't think that's necessary. Um, thoughts on Biter being a squisher and the long tongue Brienne, the long tongue Brienne felt was being a squisher tongue, not a sword. Um, not sure I completely understand this uh, question, to be honest. Um, maybe I'm just having a slight mind black on that one. Um, I will have a think about that and look at it and try and come back to it next week if that one is okay. Um, Brian Sheeran saying, do you think Blood Raven is influencing the Ravens at Raven Tree Hall? What's the deal with that place? Thanks. So Raven Tree Hall is um, House Blackwood. Now, Blood Raven is half Blackwood himself, and it has got a huge, huge, um, and I can't remember what the word Jamie sees it, and he says it's something like enormous or something like that. This is massive uh, weirwood tree, but it's dead. And they claim that House Brack and their great rivals had poisoned it. But every day um, uh, we get all of the ravens nest in it each night uh, before flying off again in the morning. Is Blood Raven influencing them? That I think they've been doing that ever since forever which is hence the raven tree hall being the name of the house i think that that's something that's been very uh, uh well established for many many years so i don't think he's that he is i think what we've got is if you if you plot the things out on a map you've got the north and then you've got this kind of crescent of places that um in south of the neck that are the worshipping of the old gods, weirwood influenced, uh, you get old stones, you get high heart, you get raven tree hall, you get the Isle of Faces in this kind of arc that comes around and they are all very worship of the old gods, weirwoody uh, uh, inclined. And this is almost as if, if you buy into which I do, this theory that all of the weirwoods are connected underground, this is sort of their line which t takes them up to um, the north. There are other weirwoods elsewhere hidden about in various castles and all the rest of it, but in terms of where the sort of the the main, I mean, sort of the, the jugular vein of the weirwoods going north from the Isle of Faces, that's the, the path of travel that they've got going on there. So I think that's the, 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 the meaning, as it were, what's going on with it. I think it is a dead tree, but I think it's still quite a magical place. Uh, Kelly Johnson saying, will Val be John's consolation prize? No, I don't think so. Val being the uh, Northern Princess, as they, they call her. She's very beautiful. Um, but um, and John thinks so, but I don't think that he will get together with her. I think he will get together with Daenerys. Um, 
Uh, Tyler Savage, show of love and support, but any idea who's Tansy? If you're thinking uh, Tansy, um, which I, I think you are, this is um, a reference to Hosta Tully's last words. Um, I, I think this is more about the tea that he made her drink um, rather than um, anything else. Uh, uh, Betty P O H. Do you think book six will the book six will be out anytime soon? Um, I've given up on uh, making predictions about this. I will just say that all the indications are that he's not too far away from finishing. Um, but we've had those indications before. Uh, do, Dornock20 also asking, saying, you mentioned a handful of times people have been to Ashai, but what about Thoros? Did he learn everything in Mir instead of Ashai? Yeah, so his magic, such as it is, comes definitely from uh, Rolor, um and uh, not from Ashai. So he learned that from the temples of Rolor. Eric Ferg, how and when do you do the remaining members of House Bolton include Walder die? Does Ramsay kill his father and stepmother, who ultimately murders Ramsay? Uh, so um, Ram Bruce Bolton, having married um, this is um, Waldo Frey, um, and she is now apparently pregnant he has said part jokingly but he expects that uh, ramsey will murder any sons that come from that marriage um so i think that there's a fair chance that that's going to happen um ramsey i, I don't think we should take it yes on the show ramsey murdered it, all of them um i don't think we should necessarily take that as being exactly what happens in the books on the show they'd lost joffrey who was the big character that everyone hated and then they introduced uh ramsey and i think they were very keen to show quite how bad and evil he was and so killing um, his own family just added to that. I don't think it's necessarily showing us that this is a thing which is going to happen in the book. So I don't think we should take that as uh, a necessity. That said, he could do. He he absolutely could do. I think that he's probably going to spend a reasonable degree of the winds of winter hunting down people like... Um, well, he's going to be looking for Jane Poole, who... Uh, has escaped, um, looking for Theon, uh, and also he will probably uh, stumble upon the returning um, uh, Shaggy Dog and Rickon. So that's going to be a large part of his early plot. If if the Boltons survive this first battle, which seems entirely likely, and he returns, then uh, yes, he may well at that point murder his father and. He, and Ramsay himself may well get murdered. If the it, on the show it was with Sansa who did that, but that's because they created that extra bit in there between uh, Sansa and Ramsay, which in, in the books was between Ramsay and Jane Poole. Very complicated way of saying. I don't think that leaves an obvious person who's going to be killing him. But if he kills Rickon, as is very likely, then John will probably do it. The Starks will take vengeance upon him. Uh, Caris uh, Messalina de Valence, a lovely name, saying, Hello, Robert. I've been wondering about the significance of the direwolf's names and the connection with the fate of their owner. This is unambiguous for all of the direwolves apart from Grey Wind. I confess I can't see a link between his name and Rob's fate. The only thing I can think of, and it's pretty tenuous, is that Rob dies so young, his life passing, as it were, as swiftly as the wind blows the grey mist over the mountains. I'm very interested in your thoughts on this. Y yes, so I think your thought is exactly right. I, I think that... It's quite poetic. Uh, Grey is very much the stark colour, and uh, it, 
if you just imagine somebody sort of saying, you know, he he burned brightly. He but he was his life was like a, a grey wind which which blew and there's now no more. And that is that is the feel of it. I think that there's no, um, uh, th there's nothing more that we've been offered that suggests that there's any any more to it than that. The other names, I mean, I think we now, um, think of them as being pretty obvious. But they're also, I mean, before the show, summer was generally deemed to be a little bit of a, what's that mean? Why is, why is it summer? Um, and we were also perhaps a little confused by Shaggy Dog and Nymeria was, yes, okay, Arya's being a bit of a fighter. Uh, so I don't think that... Um, George R. R. Martin wanted us necessarily when they were first introduced to know what they meant. We're only supposed to be able to look at them in hindsight and go, okay, that that is what it meant. So Ghost, for example, yes, it makes absolute sense looking back um, to say, well, John died and came back like ghosts do. Um, we haven't reached that story in the books yet. So uh, I don't think it's as mysterious as um, – I, I, I think it's more mysterious in the books, but has, made been, has been made less mysterious by the show. Uh, reflective lamp, uh, Rambling, thank you so much, picking up something for Ian Kiplinski, saying, given that one of the properties of the candles – I assume this is the glass candles – is to give visions, could all dragon dreams or green dreams originate from outside of those that dream them? Um, I mean, they could, but uh, glass candles have only recently started to work again. Um, we hear that they start working again after Danny's dragons um, are hatched. And indeed, in the Citadel, the fact that the glass candles do not work is a central part of their um, uh, initiation ceremonies. You spend an entire night with four glass candles trying to make them do something, and you can't do it, and that one, that's, that's proving to you that glass candles and magic do not work. This is how, for incidentally, it's another hint of how much the maesters want to show magic isn't real, it doesn't exist. Uh, they, they make you spend an entire night trying to do magic, uh, and the lesson that you're supposed to learn is that magic does not work. Um, I say all that because green dreams existed before uh, the glass candles started working, so they definitely haven't got a link across to them. Glass candles being obsidian have more of a link probably across to um, fire magic, um, but I don't think that this that the dragon dreams again. There are dragon dreams that happened before all of that. Um, so I think the short answer is no uh, to that one. Uh, but thank you. Um, uh, reflective rambling. If you're going, uh, thank you so much for for coming in and your generosity and kindness. Uh, family coming soon. Um, so uh, yeah, absolutely. Go see your family. Um, question from Cloaked One again, picking up for something else uh, for Sheev Palpatine. Uh, Cloaked One and Reflective Rambling are being very generous today. Thank you very much. Uh, for Sheev Palpatine, what do you think of Lady Stoneheart reviving Rob? Um, I think I may have a question from this. Um, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll answer this one together with this is Sylvia Galasso. Uh, saying, uh, ciao, Robert. Uh, my question today is about Lady Stoneheart. Lem, this is Lem Lemoncloak, who's sort of being her interpreter, says that she wants her son alive or the people who killed him dead. Does it mean they are actively looking for Rob's body to try and bring it back to life? Um, I know there are some theories about this, but they seem a bit far-fetched. Any thoughts? Uh, so will she revive Rob? Now, Rob has been dead now for months. Um, now, my take on that line from Len 
saying she wants her son alive or the people who killed him dead is uh, it's not a literal she wants her son back alive thing i think this is uh, and i think it's a show only line i haven't found it in the books uh when the hound says um i'm here to kill people and eat chicken and i'm all out of chicken uh, he doesn't say people but um uh the line I think is the same feel is that I want, I want one or the other, but I can't have one. So I'm going to do the other. And that is the kind of feeling that she is not going to get Rob back. She doesn't, she's not going to get Rob alive. So all that's left to her is vengeance on the people who killed him. That I think is what that line is trying to say. Um, and is she actively trying to find him and his body even if she did, there would be so little of him left from what we understand of how this works. When she came back, she'd been dead a few days and a huge amounts of who she was have has gone. Um, every time Beric Dondarrion went away, he and came back very quickly afterwards, but each time he lost a bit. If Rob did come back and remembered, Rob has lost his head. Uh, so this is an even harder thing to suggest. But even if he did, he would lose so much of himself that he would hardly be there. So I do not think that that's what's uh, what's happening. Um, I think that they are literally going on a revenge, just simply going on a revenge mission. Um, Eric Fogg, though, saying, why did, and we're shifting over now to Dawn, why did Aris Oakheart make the suicidal charge at Hota? Now, so Aris Oakheart uh, is a book only character. He uh, went, he's a member of the Kingsguard, and he went with Princess Marcella to Dawn, uh, swearing to protect her. He was there six months before Ariane Martel seduced him, got him in on her plans, which were. Uh, manifold and complex, but part of them were putting Marcella on the throne instead of King Tommen, uh, because in Dawn it's the oldest that inherits, not just the oldest male. And so she then uh, brings him along with her little gang of co conspirators, at which point they are confronted uh, by Ariel Hota, who is Don Martel's right hand man and bodyguard. And um, we then get Aris Oakheart, who, seeing that they've been rumbled, then suddenly charges at them, and he takes down a couple, but dies. And the question is, why? I mean, it, it does seem like a suicide mission, but I think if we get into his head, and we do have one POV chapter there, he seems quite idealistic. He seems also to be very committed to his promise to Marcella, so he is absolutely wanting to be on her side, but he's also, he will be very aware that he is um, backing what is an open rebellion against the king in King's Landing. So it is it is a do or die for him. It, Marcella would be able to get back out of this. Uh, there's no doubt about that. She was just taken along by other people. She's not going to be abandoned by the Lannisters. He would be killed for it. So it is a do or die thing for him. And I think that's what it was that he just thinks that's, this is it. This is the best chance I've got. I'm uh, fully armored on a horse. Um, I can do this. I can take them on. And, and he did take a couple of them out to be fair. Uh, question from Uh, Chaos Ballerina, you said before that the losses at Summerhall allowed for Rhaegar to be born. He was the dragon that hatched. Does this mean something about Rhaegar is magical? Um, uh, Lady Pushkins, you asked, sorry, I'll come back to Chaos in just a moment. Lady Pushkins, I just spotted saying, the scepter that marries Rob is the same one that marries Rhaegar in flashback. Do you think this is the same scepter or just using the same actor like they did with Tommen? I did answer that one a little bit earlier in the live stream. Uh, you put it over on Patreon. Uh, I I think it's just a, the same actor, perhaps, but uh, doesn't tell us. It's it's not a deliberate thing to try and um, show that there are implications between the two things. Um, 
Uh, Curse Bellerina asking about uh, whether there's something about Rhaegar that is magical. Yes, I think that there is. Uh, I think that um, Blood Raven is attempting to create this magical something, uh, being the line of the prince that was promised. Rhaegar himself thought that he must be the prince that was promised. Um, Blood Raven. His plan was that Rhaegar's son should be the prince that was promised, and joining with another no, magical bloodline being the Starks. So that's what it was. Yes, he's magical, um, and the, he is the. This is the culmination of Ray uh, of Blood Raven's long attempt to be culling the family tree to get the exact uh, genetic sequencing that he wants. Um. Question, uh, Warren Blythe uh, asking about Rob's head. Um, and I've got another question about, actually, I've got, I'm going to pick up on that later. I've got a question from one of my patrons about that. Um, uh, Mathieu Dominique uh, saying that Matt, Joe Magician, claims that Stoneheart will get Rob alive again. Uh, I mean, far be it from me to, uh, to disagree with Matt. I personally don't think so, but George R. R. Martin does go quite gruesome at times. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. If she does bring back his body, then that would be horrendous because it's been decomposing for months. Um, Catherine Furseth uh, saying, um, I wanted to ask about the threat from the from ice um the very start of this story back in book one opens with the others appearing then all, they're almost never seen again other than people's vague notions and understanding different cultures in our world have legends about ice people for example japan with the ice women with pale transparent skin who somehow killed with the cold what are the others um and what is brand's role in fighting ice so uh in terms of uh, the who they are the best understanding we have right now is or the best guess the thing that fits the facts the best right now is what r roughly what they showed on the show which is that the the others were created the white walkers were created by the children of the forest to be a weapon to fight against the um, the first men. Now, what, why do I say that that fits things? Because we know that there was a long battle between the first men and the children of the forest, and the children of the forest were losing. We know that, and yet somehow they came to a, a peace treaty that uh, not only the first men said okay well we'll stop attacking you uh, and we're going to leave parts of this world to you but also they took on the the religion of the children of the forest which seems to imply something must have happened to show the power of the children of the forest um that made the uh, the first men want to follow their gods uh, and respect them and give them space and not attack them anymore what could possibly have happened well if they created some sort of weapon something which showed their power do the others match what that might be well yes because they are if you had to create a, a monster to fight against humans you would have one that is impervious to the weapons that humans use which is what the others are. You would have one that um, can uh, overcome the number differential, which clearly was there with the children of the forest who didn't have many children, whereas humans kept on growing, having babies and growing up, and the population was growing. But they could, the others could overcome that by raising the dead humans to use and fight against the humans. Um, this all kind of makes sense if you were to create this kind of super army. They're stronger than humans and all the rest of it. Then you would say, okay, well, maybe we just want to make sure that we've got something which makes 
that makes them if we created these super soldiers we need to have a fail safe to make sure that they don't then attack us why don't we make them vulnerable to the thing that we use to fight dragon glass so it it matches all of this and the fact that the last hero myth that we have the uh, the way that they were defeated appears to be the the key appears to be through the children of the forest. The children of the forest, this is where the last hero went, hunted down the children of the forest, and then we don't get the details of how they were destroyed, but uh, it was certainly something to do with the children of the forest. And the children of the forest were there working with humanity to create the, the defences against their return, the wall and such like. So it all, that is our best working theory. As you say, we haven't yet had much information from George R. Martin in the stories, the, in the books themselves, about the others. So we're still waiting uh, after the Winds of Winter. Hopefully we should have enough that we can actually say whether that is right or whether there is something else. What we do know is that George R. R. Martin says that they are um, a different kind of life form. So they are not undead they are a different created kind of life form and we know that the thing which put the uh the world out off of its axis that made all the seasons go out of balance is a major magical thing so what would be a major magical thing creating the entire new life force perhaps so all of the hints are there but we don't have any confirmation yet so that's the the best thing in terms of brand's role now um summer implies that he will be ruling over summer so not just bringing spring but summer um a spring after the long winter but it for the others to be defeated this is not going to be a matter of just we we can be better than them at fighting that is not how george R. martin is going to end this story is that um having shown us all this time how war is terrible and people die and suffer, he's not going to show the big baddie being defeated by just a war. Hooray, we actually we figured out how to beat them. That's not what it's going to be. They were going to be... The magic that created them will be undone in some way. That is what is um, what the, the the end game of this is. And Bran will be the person who understands that. Bran, through the Weirwood Network, will be the person who understands that. Um, Eric Ferg asking, what do the White Walkers do with all the sheep that Craster started giving them? Uh, one of his daughter wives speculated that they would have to start giving them dogs soon as the sheep were going to run out. Uh, yeah, so he get, he gives his sons, but when he doesn't have a son to give, then he gives sheep. And uh, when he doesn't have sheep, they're a bit worried about what he might give next. Now, uh, my what do they do with them? I think they take them. But my general feel is that this is a clear hint that Craster he doesn't. He doesn't know what he's doing. This is just an offering to the gods, an offering to the cold gods. That's what he is doing. And the best offering he can give is a son, but after that, then he'll give a, a, a sheep. Uh, that's the, the, the feel. He's not got this complicated deal and agreement with them that he sort of sat down and written uh, with them and they've signed off and said, okay, well, we'll let you survive, we'll go after the other ones. That's not what's going on here. This is a feel very much from ancient history when you would try and appease the gods by giving them sacrifices, and you would give them as good a sacrifice as you possibly could. Uh, and when you didn't have that, then you would give them the next best thing you had. That is the feel, I think, and that George R. Martin is trying to get us to see here. This is not... Uh, they say, well, we would like boys and we would like sheep. Um, that is not what it is. He is just giving them what he thinks is the best thing that he can. Uh, question from John Martin. Oh, just saying thanks for the great content. Well, thank you very much, John. I do appreciate that. Um, Sir Bunk the Lunk saying, can you discuss 
Blood Raven's motivations. You seem to paint him as a character with a totally benign core whose flaws have to do with sacrificing too much or assuming he knows best and there's no better way. Uh, to put it another way, you seem to argue that the moral dilemma with Blood Raven is do the ends justify the means? I find your argument that he's behind Summerhall, John's birth, ghost discoveries, Brand's training, etc., more uh, quite convincing except that taken together they seem to suggest blood uh, seem to make blood raven an almost entirely good character surely the ends would justify almost any means when the ends is saving humanity from complete apocalypse but his backstory as hand and depiction in the dance make me distrust him deeply i'll need a serious explanation as to how he changes from villainous targaryen loyalist to martyr-esque dumbledorean guardian if it turns out that he's more good than bad. Well, first of all, martyr-esque Dumbledorean guardian is a fantastic phrase. Thank you for that. Um, I uh, have not intended to put across the idea that he is a totally benign person whose flaws are to do with sacrificing too much. That is not where I see him. Um, I think that the question is with him the moral question with him is uh, uh, at least partly around of do the ends justify the means but as always with george r. r martin it's do his understand does his understanding of the end justify the means now what we've got uh, lots of characters who think they understand what is needed in order to save humanity melisandre is a classic example. She thinks she understands what is needed, and so the things that she does are in order to uh, justify, are, are in order to support the end that she's trying to achieve. Now, we all think that she's running, mean, maybe. Some people are there, uh, undying Stannis believers, but uh, the, the general view is that Stannis is not a Zora High reborn. He is not this person who's going to lead humanity against the others. So for her, the ends justify the means may well be how she justifies it to herself, but that does not necessarily mean it's entirely right. The same goes for Bloodraven, is that he is doing all he does in order to set up John as being this person who is going to uh, save the day and save humanity against the others. Is he going to be right? But we don't know yet. We, see, we genuinely do not know. It's interesting. I don't like to take too much from the show season eight as being like an exact marker, but it was notable that John was not that hero who saved the day. Yes, he had a role to play, but he was not the hero that saved the day in the North. He had a huge role to play down in the South, but in the North, not so much, actually. At the end of it, it, it was down to others. So is... Is uh, Blood Ravens, the ends justify the means fair? Not if he's wrong about the ends. Definitely not. Um, and the rest is debatable, debatable even if he is. You, you talk about the uh, Targaryen loyalist to Dumbledorean um, uh, martyr. Uh, so I don't think that he is martyring himself. I think he, I think he thinks he knows best. Um, I think he thought he knew best from very early on. Targaryen loyalist when he started out, yes, absolutely. But this was a part of his plan in order to create John, and in order to create John, he wanted to get the uh, the sort of the the genetic plan right for the Targaryens to create the prince that was promised. There were dozens, literally dozens, of Targaryens around when blood raven started then they dropped at a rate of about one a year and some of them uh, if you count the blackfires as targaryens they certainly shared the blood, blood targaryen bloodline even if they had a different surname um when you include them you'll find that six or seven died by blood raven's own hand people with targaryen blood another um handful of them died very clearly on his orders uh, another few were overlooked in the succession um in the great council that he was chairing uh, another few died in uh, really quite bizarre ways like um 
choking to death on a lamprey pie, things like that. There were this was all, and it was at a rate that was just ridiculous. Uh, there wasn't a big uh, Dance of the Dragons. This was action, almost certainly by him. Now, that does not, to my mind, make him a Targaryen loyalist. That makes him a loyalist to his view of what is needed, which was to create the prince that was promised with a very specific bloodline. By the time we see him in the Dance with Dragons, um, he is very much a part of the Weirwood network. There is part of him still remaining, but he is there very much joined up with uh, with them. So uh, I, I see this as a personally as a very clear progression uh, across and with a theme of trying to deliver uh, the prince that was promised uh, all the way through it, right from his early days of getting rid of Targaryen pretenders all the way up to guiding Bran and Jon um, in the north in the current story. Um, question from uh, 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 oh, Keelan Wade. You've, you've been asking who my personal favourite character is. It's, Tyrion is. Um, I, I really enjoy Tyrion. Um, doesn't mean I like him as a person, uh, but I find him the most interesting to read. Robbie Day, thank you for the super chat. Uh, it says message retracted. I don't know uh, whether that's you or one of the moderators. Um, uh, so if... If you have a question, please do drop it into the chat, and I'm sure one of the moderators will pick it up. Sheev Palpatine saying, uh, the showrunner said they didn't have John kill the Night King uh, only to subvert expectations. Um, so they said that they, they didn't have him do it only to subvert expectations. Okay. Um, uh, question from Shauna Bass, thank you, saying, George R. Martin recently tweeted a Mandela quote that heroes don't destroy, they build. Do you think he'll use Danny to convey this in A Song of Ice and Fire or Cersei or someone else? Um, well, he's got a lot of characters who destroy. Um, Cersei definitely destroys. She, the, I was reading recently again the chapter where she burns the Tower of the Hand um, with wildfire. And she loves it. She's that after the whole party's gone away and, and gone back inside, she stands there in, in the, the moonlight watching it burn. And it's um, it's quite noticeable how much she loves the destruction. So she is definitely somebody who uh, destroys Danny, both builds up and destroys. Uh, she is classic that there are good and bad things about her and we'll see where she goes in the next two books in terms of building things um i, I mean i i don't i didn't see the i didn't see the tweet uh so my he, he may well have been not talking about his literary works at all he may have been making a, a point about the world today um which is absolutely fair enough um but in terms of people who build stuff, I think you can look around to not just Bran the Builder, but um, John tries to build new things uh, at, at the wall as Lord Commander and the like. So, uh, yeah, I think that that reflects his worldview as much as anything else. Um, mm -mm, question from oh, Robbie Day. I think this is the... The question we mixed missed earlier, saying there's a Brienne chapter that begins east of Maiden Maidenpool, the hills rose wild, in homage to Lovecraft's colour out of space. Do you know of other instances where sentences from other works are used? Um, I don't know about sentences from other works. He he uses names a lot. Uh, I mean, one of my favourite ones. He obviously loves Tolkien. Arthur Dane, uh, of the great knight um, from the Kingsguard, who was at the Tower of Joy, um, 
is a very clear um, nod to the last uh, empire or the last empire uh, the northern empire of arnold was split into three one part being arthur dane um all one word and that george R. R. martin has clearly lifted that up um, as a little uh, nod to tolkien in terms of actual whole phrases I'm not sure if I know of any others. May this is the kind of thing people in the chat may have picked up on. Uh, so please do uh, drop that into the chat if you know of any. Uh, Caius Ballerina saying thoughts on Magor being cruel because he was a white, and Danny possibly walking into Drogon at the end of the TV series. Uh, she destroys the Iron Throne. Uh, okay, well I'll pick on those two quickly. So Magor, this is Magor the Cruel. Now he was. Um, uh Visenya's son and so he uh the rumors were that Visenya used black magic in order to have him conceived now is that true well it's possible but then at the same time the maesters wrote the histories and the maesters seem to think every other woman uses black magic uh so we can't take them too seriously on that one uh, so was he a white i don't think so my best guess probably is that maybe there was something about his birth that and and that meant that he um was uh infertile and perhaps not of the greatest of temperaments but he was magor the cruel but he was not completely unlike other Targaryens. Yes, he killed lots of people, but lots of Targaryens have wanted to kill lots of people and have succeeded in killing lots of people. So I don't think there's a need for a specific explanation for it. Uh, the second question about Danny possibly walking into Drogon at the end of the TV series. She destroys the Iron Throne. Uh, I mean, possibly, but she's not uh, she's not a green seer. She's not got walking abilities. Uh, so there's nothing that has led up to that as a an idea. I mean, I like it. The destroying the Iron Throne, I, the showrunners came up with some uh, logic that I can't even remember. Um, I, in the books, the Iron Throne will be destroyed thematically. I think it absolutely has to to show that everybody fighting and squabbling over the Iron Throne, it was all for naught. In, in the way that the Iron Throne is a bit like the One Ring in Lord of the Rings. That's that's the kind of feel that we've got going now. So it will have to be. And it may well be just one of those things on the show where they, they knew it had to happen, but the other decisions they'd made, other creative decisions they'd made, meant that the things that would have made it happen in the books wouldn't happen in on the show so they changed it around a bit and drogon did it instead the the fact that drogon does melt it does make some echoing sense in book world as well because it was forged by the fires of Beleriand, the black dread and the first Targaryen king of westeros and danny the last Targaryen ruler of westeros she did sit on that iron throne um with Drogon, who is an echo of Beleriand, that does make a lot of sense, that that ends that whole cycle. She did break the wheel, in a way. Um, uh, Eminon Fox saying, uh, check out Danny's relationship with her silver. She definitely has a knack, which may be a natural walking ability. Yeah, I understand that as an idea it doesn't ever seem to get quite that far she develops a bond the the silver the silver horse she has is in many ways a, a bit of foreshadowing for dragons in that uh, when she gets given it then uh, there's this i mean foreshadowing is probably the only way of describing it uh, she leaps over a fire in it and over the fire and it feels like she's flying and it's like this is this is so just saying she's going to fly on a, a fiery dragon um but that's um uh, more um 
uh, sort of theoretical stuff. I think I don't think that there's any any particular specific hints that she is uh, is is a warging. She's certainly not of the first men who seem to have that ability. Um, question from um, Seltz saying. Hi, Robert. Joined a few months ago on Patreon and wanted to share some thoughts with you. But then my wife and I found out we were expecting. Congratulations. That is an excellent reason not to be uh, uh, focusing in on writing questions on Patreon. Uh, I hope all goes well for you over the coming uh, weeks and months. Um, in terms of magic and its presence throughout George's world here, do you think there may be a direct correlation between the White Walkers, others returning, and Danny's resurrection of dragons? Um, as if one magic was able to feed off another, as Melisandre's magic is more powerful at the wall. Um, well, th that is definitely a part of the way that magic seems to work. Melisandre says that her magic is more powerful at the wall. The wall is clearly a hugely magical thing, and then her magic seems to be amplified by it. When Danny's dragons come, they bring more magic in the world, and we get reports of magical things happening. Somebody who was a fire mage can suddenly do a huge amount more over in Karth. The glass candles are working again, that kind of thing. So yes, it's entirely possible, but the clear link is across with the Red Comet. Magic seems to symbolically come from the skies, come from above in this uh, world that George R. R. Martin has uh, created. Um, the So might the um return of the others have allowed that possibly by creating a greater degree of background magic in the world if i if i had to I mean tinfoil hat on at this point there was a level of magic in the world with the dragons and then the dragons went away summer hall clearly was a magical event or an attempt at a magical event then we get the return of the others then we get the return of the dragons, then we get the return of other kinds of magic, uh, including the resurrections and all the rest of it. So that, to me, seems the logical iteration. But the causality is uh, not completely clear. They, it, magic amplifies magic is clear. The causality between events is not clear. Howland's little sister... Uh, of. The, all the main char many characters, places, and mysteries within the world created by George R. Martin. There are two story elements. Everyone is waiting to make an appearance. Howland Reed and House Dane. What are your thoughts about how these two Chekhov's gun narrative principles will re-emerge in the story? House Dane is too tantalizing to be a red herring. There must be some hidden power or revelation that is a fulcrum upon which their story will advance. I see Howland Reed and House Dane as integral to the completion of this tale. What can you say about these two important storylines? Um, okay, so Howland Reed will return. George R. Martin has said that he will return. He said that he won't return just yet because he knows too much, and when he does, that's when secrets come out. So he's holding him back. He will return when John, according to Bloodraven's plans, this is Bloodraven working with the Weirwood Network, when John needs to know about his history, about the Tower of Joy, about who he is, that's not going to happen until House Stark have... Uh, control of Winterfell at the very earliest. So that is the um, the time at which he is going to arrive back. Maybe the ends of Winds of Winter, probably in a dream of spring. House Dane, their importance to the plot going forward, in my view, is their sword. They played a huge role around the time of the Tower of Joy, Robert's Rebellion, all the rest of it, and they have kept hold of this sword through millennia. But in terms of who House Dane is right now, we've got Edric Dane, who is too young to be significantly involved in this story. And then we've got Darkstar. Darkstar will probably take the sword. He will probably join Fagon's Kingsguard, uh, I suspect, and that is what is going to bring... Uh, the sword dawn back into the story. So that is where uh, I see them going. I don't see House Dane, I see their their role of being the historical one, keeping the sword through all this time. And then the sword itself will become important later on in the story. 
Um, question from Kamal Rifka. Uh, what did you think of MUFC versus LFC today? As a red, I'm in ecstasy. Uh, P.S. What's up with Ulthos? That dark continent by Oshai. Though the map, uh, through the map up, it seems corrupted somehow. Uh, let's not talk about football today. Um, this is <laughs> this this is the Game of Thrones stream. There may be other days I may be more interested in talking about football, but let's not talk about that today. Um, what's up with Ulthos? I did answer a question on this earlier. Um, the dark continent by Oshai. Uh, the map. Art makes it look corrupted somehow. We do not know, and George R. R. Martin has said that he has left it deliberately vague to show the the Westerosi centric perspective through which we are seeing this story. Uh, there are things over there that we do not know, so we are not going to be told uh, about it. That's um, uh, that's the. The basic aren't. I mean, I wish I could tell you more. George R. R. Martin specifically said we're not going to know more. Uh, uh, Abby, uh, my arachnophobia has me always wondering about old man's ice spiders, big as hounds. What are your thoughts? Might they actually show up? I think they probably will. I think they probably will. Uh, they, um, I think they make an appearance. I may be wrong on this, but in John's dream of uh, when he's dressed as Azora High Reborn and he's standing atop the wall, ice spiders scuttling up it. Um, that, I think, is the most likely place for us to be really seeing. When the army of the dead approaches the wall, having ice spiders climbing up and over it is it's the kind of visual George R. R. Martin would love. Yes, uh, if your arachnophobia um, does not like spy uh, does not like the idea of ice spiders, it definitely won't like the, ice the idea of ice spiders climbing a massive ice wall and then uh, scrambling over into the world of men. That does not work uh, very well, I suspect. But yeah, they will. I think they will be there. They got mentioned. People have picked up on them. I think George R. R. Martin will, at the very least, give a little nod to that. Um, uh, Monkey Tron never took you for a sport ball fan in Deep Geek. I, I, I'm like an onion. I have many layers. Um, Diego Godoy saying, "Hola, Robert. I'm finally catching up on your live streams after a month focused on preparing my PhD defence, which was successful." Congratulations. Uh, I hope that soon you'll be changing your um, your username to Dr. Diego or something like that. That would be fantastic. My question is, during your re-listening to A Game of Thrones, what moment or character action has seemed the most out of character uh, or out of place? For uh, I've been rereading A Game of Thrones too, and for me it's John's first chapter when he interacts with Tyrion at Winterfell, and we read that Tyrion pushed himself off the ledge into empty air, uh, John gasped, then watched with awe as Tyrion Lannister spun around in a tight ball, landed lightly on his hands, then vaulted backwards onto his legs. That always takes me by surprise, given what we know of Tyrion. Um, yes, uh, the so the deeper you go into the books, the more you this does make sense for Tyrion, because then later on he is forced into being a performing dwarf who has to cavort for people's um, amusement and this is sort of like the kind of thing that he used to really look down on and now he's having to be that and so this does sort of pay off the further down you go at the time yes it did feel a little bit odd i will admit but it, i think it does it does pay off um, in terms of other things that kind of like stand out as odd, um, I, I can remember something which at the time stood out as odd, uh, but now I've, uh, and I think I'll probably will when I actually read it again, I'm, I'm slightly more at peace with, was John's reaction to the pink letter, which seemed very, uh, when he got it, this it, it really kind of like, nasty letter but why he suddenly jumped up and said right that's it i'm quitting everything i'm going out to sort this out uh, it seemed a little bit 
of an overreaction. But I, I'm more at peace with that now for the simple reason that as I go through it, the books, I see how many times he considers leaving the wall. And it's a lot. He does before he even properly joins up. He goes out and, um, and on a horse and sort of looks back at Castle Black and thinks, yeah, I could just ride back to Winterfell now. Then there was that time when he does make an escape bid. Then um, when he's north of the wall again with the greet, then he's thinking about it. He, this is this is not a rare thought for him. This I maybe I should leave the wall. He he thinks it a lot of times. Um, Sam Chastain, hi Robert. Do you foresee a widespread planting of weirwood trees or general growth of the weirwood network in places? Uh, where they had previously been cut down following Bran's ascension to the throne. Um, I don't think we're going to see this is one of those um, uh, this is one of those things that is if it does happen it's after the end of the story uh, so I don't think we're going to see that. Would the Weirwood uh, Network want the trees to be replanted? I mean possibly uh, but I suspect that they won't want most people knowing that the king is part of their network, so they wouldn't wish to raise uh, draw attention to it. Question from uh, Nicola Tricola. Um, hi, Robert. I hope you're well. I am. Thank you. I was wondering if you can talk about the God's Eye or Isle of Faces. Both Adam Valarion and Howland Reed went there, possibly took advice from green men, and later did big things. But how does it work? I mean, is there some kind of magical barrier? Uh, one would say that maesters would basically camp there in order to find out about the pact and the order of the green uh, men and such. Uh, but everything around it is shrouded in mystery. Um, so also, what do you think happened to Damon Targaryen's body? So Damon Targaryen's body... He was one of the people I mentioned a little bit earlier on the Dragonback, had a fight uh, over the God's Eye Lake, and they all crashed down into the water. His body was never seen again. I think he's fish food. I think that that's, I mean, as much as he was an incredibly epic and exciting and interesting character, um, I think it, it appeals to George R.R. R. Martin, the idea that someone so wonderful could ha just have an ignominious end doesn't get a massive send-off yes it's an epic battle but then where's his body don't know not sure um and he just died uh, that i think appeals to him completely in terms of the defenses of the isle of uh, faces we're never told in any detail but the way that it's described is it's just that if you try and try and go there you can't but through forces of nature by which I mean you you sail a boat out there and then a gust of wind blows you away or the currents mysteriously move you off somewhere or you get quite close and a whole load of birds come in and sort of like uh, attack you, that kind of thing. That's that's the feel that we, to the point where people just don't now, they don't need to, you don't, you don't have to cross over to the Isle of Faces so, and it's far enough away that it's not, a destination you're going to so not many people do um howland reed was clearly summoned and allowed to go there uh, adam valarion i'm in two minds about whether he was allowed to land or whether it was simply a matter of he came in on a whopping great big dragon nobody had tried to do that before and he landed um and then went away again that sort of makes sense. He didn't tell anyone what he what happened when he was there or anything like that. He died relatively swiftly afterwards. So there doesn't appear to be any huge plot significance to it. Other than George R. R. Martin wanting his world to be uh, reasonable and rational. And I think that he knows that he's got a world with dragons and people who ride dragons and they would naturally go and explore places that are hard to get to. So he does tell us about 
dragons going to the top of the Erie, a dragon trying to explore beyond the wall, um, and one landing in the Isle of Faces. But he doesn't want to tell us about what happened soon afterwards. That, for me, feels sort of right. I don't... There's nothing about Adam Valarion that implies that he is specifically plot important um, other than showing that a, a dragon could land down on there uh, and then fly away. Um, a question in the chat, Jeffrey Gunn. Uh, oh, just saying no particular comment or question, just a great chat. Thank you very much. Um, the, the, I've been seeing there's some fantastic questions um, in the chat. Uh, Mark Adams saying a shout out to all the wonderful mods here tonight. Yes, uh, I've got this far without doing that. Um, shame on me. I have some fantastic and wonderful moderators. So uh, thank you very much uh, for keeping a, a close eye on everything that's going on in the chat. If you are watching this live, if you're in the live chat, um, could you just give a little bit of love to the moderators? They are absolutely wonderful. Something else I always do uh, partway through my live streams is give a big thank you to my patrons. I've been working my way through my patrons' questions. If you want to support this channel, if you want to get access to some stuff I do just for my patrons, if you want to have priority questions answered, uh, like the ones that I've been working my way through today, the way to do that is go to the link down in the description. There is a link to my Patreon page. Um, Question from Sam Shustain. Um, can you speak how you think the timing of some of the final events of the series will play out? Do you think that part of the fight with Euron will be intermingled with the fight with the White Walkers, particularly around the God's Eye Lake, given the foreshadowing of a fight there and the significance with the Children of the Forest? It seems like if a huge apocalyptic fight with the zombies... Uh, it seems like that would be something Euron would want to get involved with. Um, yeah, so he would. He likes the idea of uh, the world being uh, destroyed. Um, my general feeling, if I'm trying to work my way back from the end, is that George R. Martin has been very clear that the, the end that he wants to replicate is one that has the feel of the scouring of the Shire. And what he means by that is that there is after the big baddies have been defeated, then you just get the secondary baddie um, back home, as it were, who then has to be finally routed out by the uh, the returning heroes who are broken and bruised by their encounter, but wiser and older. Now, who might this secondary baddie be? Well, I think that the most likely candidate is Euron, who fits into the Saruman mould, as it were. So I think that he will be. I think that there's a good chance that um, after that, when the uh, people head north to be fighting against the others then uh, or confronting them at least then it may well be that Cersei and Euron move east uh, certainly it would make sense if they took say Harren Hall that seems like exactly a Euroney place maybe they even take King's Landing uh, but that I think is the final bit after we've dealt with the others and uh, with the dragons then we get Euron just to finish it all off uh, Matthew Hawkins hi Robert uh, your live streams are a wonderful insight into the world of ice and fire thank you very much um, please offer an opinion on my alternative Stannis Baratheon theory uh, bearing in mind George R. R. Martin loves the concept of history repeating itself might it be that Stannis does not die, but ends up becoming the future leader of the Golden Company, based in exile over in Essos? This may sound a contradiction to the statement he makes about the Golden Company in the Winds of Winter Theon preview chapter. However, this may highlight the ultimate failure of his self-righteous attitude. Um, and they will need a new leadership, as both John Connington and Harry Strickland are probably not long for this world. Yeah, I like the idea. I don't I don't think that's where this is going to be going. Um, 
Uh, Stannis is very focused in on his thing in the north, and I think just he's not going to take setbacks, and he's not going to go, oh, well, I'll just head off into exile. He's just going to carry on going. That seems to be his character. Um, and the Golden Company themselves, they come from the original, as I'm sure you know, the original Blackfire rebels. This feels like their last... Um, attack last attempt to get back into westeros uh, in the same way that we're wrapping up the targaryen era is the feeling it is danny is is echoing aegon's invasion the the blackfire rebellion is going to be echoed by the um the golden company coming in once more uh, and we'll get the dance of the dragon air echoes with dragons fighting one another so that's how I feel that is all panning out. Uh, and I don't think that the Golden Company as a whole will last that long because, they, yes, they will have short-term successes with Fagon uh, claiming King's Landing, but I think that they will lose to Danny ultimately. Uh, Kevin Warner, I'm listening to Fire and Blood for the first time, and I'm currently on Rhaenyra's downfall. I have a couple of questions. Is Alice Rivers a red priestess, a green seer? She sees visions in flames a couple of times, or is she a pretender? What about, uh, what do you think killed Arya Targaryen? Okay, so the second one, Arya Targaryen, for those who don't remember, is the Targaryen prince who climbed onto the back of Valerian the Black Dread, this ancient fierce dragon, uh, and it flew east, flew away, then returns much, much later, and Valerian has been badly injured, and Arya has a really quite horrific um uh, problems with the uh, worms and the horrible big malformed fire beasts within her squirming under the skin. She dies. Uh, Septon Bath manages to um, uh, kill the beasts by freezing them, effectively covering her in ice. And um, the question is, what were they? Well, Valerian almost certainly went to back to Valyria. That's where Valerian was born. And so he almost certainly flew back there. And what will have got her from, if you look back at my live streams from a couple of years, a couple of years ago, a couple of weeks ago when I was looking at old Valyria, then you will see that they, the, the Valyrians at the time, did huge amounts of sort of gene splicing of creating monsters crossed with other monsters and this uh, part of what it seems to have been was to create dragonish wormy monsters um, who survive in lava and therefore would have survived the doom of valeria itself so it's some of them and we don't know what they are because nobody goes into Valyria and comes out alive. So we do not have a name for them other than horrible, um, wormy, dragony, wivany monsters. Um, and your first question about Alice Rivers. So Alice Rivers is a great character in Fire and Blood, appears in Dance with Dragons. She's Harren Hall. She is, uh, like so many other female characters in um, Fire and Blood, uh, called by the maesters a, a witch or a dealer in back magic or something along those lines. Um, what we know is that she did apparently see some things and watch the flames for messages, seemed to get it right. She also appeared to be younger than she was. She must be at least 40, apparently, but she did not look anywhere near 40. So what's going on? Was she a magic user? Probably. It's entirely possible. We don't really get much mention of the priests of R'hllor, um in Fire and Blood, so they probably weren't as much of a presence then. Uh, so maybe she is one of them who's come over, who learned skills over in Essos. We do not know where she comes from. She's apparently an illegitimate child um, uh, in Harrenhal um, who uh, grew up there. So maybe 
she was taught by somebody. It, it's not at all clear. What I think is very probable is that she is not a, a black magician in the sense that she is painted in fire and blood, uh, but she does claim to have Aemond Targaryen's child, which is one of these uh, issues which is overhanging for fire and blood part two, if we ever get to see that. Um, but uh, so she is a fascinating character. Is she... Um, you're wondering if she is a green seer. I do not think so. Uh, is she a red priestess? Uh, probably not actually a red priestess, but may well have learned some of the magic. The looking younger thing definitely kind of hints at Melisandre, and I think that's the idea um, that George R. Martin is wanting us to be uh, thinking about. Um Gabriel Farrell. Hi, Robert. New patron here. Welcome. Welcome to Patreon, who has been binging on live streams of late. Um, love your work and your oft-mentioned Occam's Razor character and story-based approach to the series and the theories surrounding it. Um, I wanted to ask your views about the themes of A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, it's become increasingly popular these days, especially in the screenwriting world that I'm lucky enough to find myself in, to boil a story down to a single statement, word or question that lies at the heart of the piece. Breaking Bad famously being, what would it take to turn Mr. Chips into Scarface? The Wire about the corruption of the system on the individual, etc. People obviously have many thoughts on this, and while I understand the reservations towards it, I find it immensely helpful when it comes to focusing and streamlining my writing. Given all that, question is, do you think there is one overarching theme to A Song of Ice and Fire? If not, do you think this has been harmed or uh, this has harmed or elevated George's writing of it? I can see it both ways. Um, so, uh, and you actually go on so to say, while well, watching the Broken Men stream I did a while ago, uh, is it that perhaps some of the more superfluous elements of the series, such as Brienne's wandering through the Riverlands, um, uh, is a result of George trying to take on and explore too many themes too closely in the series to the detriment of the plot and pacing? Um, so that last bit, I'm but incidentally, I'm really looking forward to rereading the Brienne chapters because I my my memory of them is that yes it takes her a very long time to be finding people and she doesn't ultimately find the people that she's looking for and therefore uh, what what value was that to the plot but uh, i have a feeling on re-listening to it i will get more out of it but anyway um in terms of the theme or themes i know my take is that he is wishing to follow the approach of J.R.R. Tolkien. And he mentions Tolkien, I don't think we can um, say too many times or with with an emphasis, he, he adores Tolkien. He hero worships what he did in The Lord of the Rings. You, you watch or read any long or even medium-sized interview with George R. R. Martin, he mentions Tolkien multiple times, uh, inspirations he's taken, things that he disagrees with, that he's had a huge influence on him. Tolkien, when writing The Lord of the Rings, was very, very clear that he disliked allegory. It's in his introduction to The Lord of the Rings. Uh, he goes into it in great de detail. And when he means allegory, it's not just a sort of a like-for-like -like in the way that say the line the witch in the wardrobe is a clear allegory for uh christianity that as land being jesus and all the rest of it that all the rest of it i do say it a lot um so it, he didn't mean it just like that he thought when he was talking about allegorical stories it was stories that are trying to make a point stories that are trying to have uh, an idea behind them. He was trying to create a mythology. He was trying to create a world that he hoped would be applicable, uh, by which he meant people could draw things from it. The great stories in Tolkien's world, and I'll come on to George R. R. Martin in just one second, the great stories in Tolkien's mind, the myths, the legends, were the things that people could continually take stuff from them. And yes, sometimes they would be uh, twisted in such a way as to be making a point, a morality point for people or whatever. Uh, they 
they existed on a plane that allowed you to continually draw different things from them all the time uh, and not just go, well, this story is about that. Now, I believe George R. R. Martin has the same feeling about his own work. He is not, he has not having a theme. I think there are many things that you could draw out from it subconsciously because no writer can ever completely divorce themselves from their own uh, biases and circumstances and all the rest of it. And there are some very clear things that you can draw out as themes within it, like the fact that uh, war, wait, you know, everyone loses war, war is never the answer, that kind of thing is very clear. Um, the quest for power is is a vain quest that does not help anyone is again very clear. The small folk, the, uh, the normal people in the world get uh, uh, ignored by uh, those with power is another theme which comes through very clear. Uh, but I don't think that he is deliberately writing those in order for us to be taking it out from there. And this comes not just from me and my way of interpreting it, but he, he gets asked about this sort of thing relatively regularly. What is it about? And he, he always sort of hums and haws and doesn't say it's about anything. It's just a, it's a, a creation that he hopes people can take stuff from. Relatively recently, he's off, he's asked a lot about whether this is an, an, an allegory in some way for climate change, for example. The others being climate change and humanity is there ignoring this existential threat to itself and fighting amongst itself, but if they do nothing, then it's just going to come and uh, wash over and destroy everyone. And he's asked about whether that was what his story is about. And he sort of says that he's very happy for people to draw that kind of uh, lesson from it, that theme from it, but that's not what he's intending. In fact, he, when he started writing it, he'd not really been thinking about climate change at all. So this is... Uh, a sort of a slightly long and roundabout way of saying I do not think George R. R. Martin would want us to boil it down to one sentence. He made this deliberately huge so that we can draw huge amounts of different lessons from it and keep talking about it rather than just having one uh, thing. Now, having one line to summarise something um, works and obviously worked very well for things like Breaking Bad. I completely get that, but that is not where George R. Martin is in terms of his writing. Um, J. Kelsey, 55. What on earth is Littlefinger doing with those tapestries from King's Landing that he had sent to the Erie? Oh, I did look into this. First. Um, somebody asked me this a while ago. I looked into it, and I came out with an answer that I was happy with, and I'm now trying to remember what the answer was. Um, so he... The, the the tapestries are Robert Baratheon's tapestries. Now, this clearly is showing a loyalty. If you have these tapestries, we, we get this dropped in in various other places where they find secret tapestries of black fires uh, in, in uh, abandoned castles. And, and so, oh, actually, these were black fire supporters. If you have these tapestries, you're showing that you are a Baratheon um, loyalist. So him taking them um, is a sort of a sign that that's what he is trying to show. But he also gives them as a gift. These are huge. They are very valuable and they are incredibly fine. And he gives them as a gift um, because the situation he is in in the Eyrie um, and in the Vale is that Lysa Arryn uh, is dead. People think he probably killed her, but they can't prove it. Robert Arryn is his ward, and so he is now effectively in charge, and the most powerful lords in the land do not like this. He is trying to buy them off one by one. One of them, he says, okay, well, maybe I will get uh, your... Uh, your heir over here to be marrying what Sansa, who he says is his uh, illegitimate daughter. Um, 
and uh, another he gives the tapestries to and they are being then shown off we see that later on uh, they're being shown off so this is clearly a big and great gift um so he is using it to bribe people he is using it also to show um thinking ahead he almost certainly is thinking ahead that the lannisters are now basically taking over in the south and he is if he's being a baratheon loyalist he is setting them up to be at the veil to be baratheon loyalists who are they going to support it's going to be Stannis Baratheon, who is in the north of this, is where he's now starting to turn his attention to. So there, with Littlefinger, there are plots within plots within plots. At a very basic level, it's a bribe for somebody because they have nice tapestries. But then he's got another few layers of thinking uh, above and beyond that. Um, question from... Steve Arnold, thank you very much, saying, hey, Robert, so glad to catch you live for the first time. Uh, welcome uh, to the, your first live stream. Haven't been a fan of your videos for the past couple of years. No question, just a massive thank you for expanding my understanding of the Song of Ice and Fire universe. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. That's uh, very kind of you. Um, uh, question from... Uh, Brennan Barnes. Hello, Robert. Greetings from Seattle. Uh, how much more, if any, will Danny learn about her potential ancient heritage from the Great Empire of the Dawn? I ask um, because I think we'd all enjoy learning more. And she's about to have access to Marwyn and Tyrion. And she's already got Quaith pleading with her to remember who she is. Are the constant references to amethysts, fallen stars, etc., purely symbolic? I think they are symbolic. I know this is not the exciting answer, but I think they are mostly symbolic. George R. R. Martin was going to take us over to a shy he's been quite clear now that that's not going to happen we might see it in flashback or memory or something along those lines but we're not going to go to a shy i i think that uh slavers bay is as far east as we're going to be getting now now danny is heading west so this is um a part of the world that is going to be left behind. Are we going to learn more about her heritage, her Targaryen heritage? Quaith is very keen on her um, regaining her Targaryen heritage, not the uh, she's Dothraki, not the she's being a queen of marine, but the fact that she's a Targaryen uh, who invades and she's going to Westeros to reclaim the kingdom that she believes is hers. So that is what, what's going on there. Might someone like Marwyn tell her about the ancient history of, of her inheritance from the far east millennia ago? Possibly, but whatever they do tell would be legend and so i don't think we're going to get and i know people would like this and it'd be fascinating if we did uh i don't think we're going to get somebody saying okay so categorically you as a targaryen came from the valerians and the valerians gained their knowledge of, of dragons from the great empire of the dawn because what happened in the great empire of the dawn this is not going to happen george R. R. martin wants them some things to remain mysterious things that happened a long time ago or a long way away he wants to remain mysterious he will draw a few more dots for us that we can then start linking things up but i don't think um uh i don't think that uh we're going to have the exact uh bit of information that we might want there um B saying, uh, hello and good evening. Please excuse this speculative and long question. Not a problem. Thanks for the quality content. It seems possible that the children invented the walkers as a defense against men. This was the theory that I set out um, a little bit ago, which is the best, I think, the best working theory that we have at the moment. Is it possible that the children or their eastern counterparts, the woods walkers, also had some part in the invention of dragons or contributed to their role in Aegon's conquest? We might see the destruction of Harrenhal as retribution for slaughter of weirwoods. Uh, when in doubt, blame Bloodraven. But is there a grander conspiracy between the children, weirwoods, shade of the evening trees, um, and the woods walkers? Um, okay, so... Um, is it possible dragons and the White Walkers are two weapons in a war between the children and the woods, uh, wood walkers? I don't think so. I think that uh, the 
children of the forest do not like fire because fire burns wood. So I do not think naturally that the dragons are the enemy that they will be. Uh, the, the, so the weapon that they would want to be choosing. We don't see anything from their magic that seems to be suggesting fire is where they would be going. Um, the the woods walkers in the northern forests of um, uh, uh, Essos are legends who sound like they might have been children of the forest. What this definitely seems to imply to us is that perhaps the the children of the forest weren't just a Westeros thing. Maybe they were over in Essos as well. The shade of the evening trees do seem to be some sort of um, uh, an hat tip to disputed lands here. She may not have come up with it first, I don't know, but it's where I get it from. Uh, the idea that they are some sort of poisoned or broken part, broken off part of the Weirwood network. So because they are very like it, but also symbolically the opposite in terms of colouring and things like that. Uh, so what seems to have happened is that there were some uh, children of the forest over on Essos, there were some weirwood trees over on Essos, then there came the sundering, the, hand, hand, blah, blah, the hammer of the waters, which destroyed the link between Westeros and Essos, and that... Uh, I think probably then poisoned or broke off the Weirwood network in Essos uh, from the hub, as it were, in in Westeros, and that is what we've got going on there. The dragons, I do not believe that they will have wanted dragons coming in the, uh, because they burn too much stuff. Are the dragons attacking Harrenhal a retribution on uh, for uh, attacks on the Weirwoods? I don't I don't think so. That doesn't seem to be. Um, yes, Heron the Black did cut down weirwood trees, but um, uh, would uh, in order to do it. But uh, are dragons the answer for the children of the forest? I don't think so. So I, I like the idea. It's it's really interesting in Team Four, but it just doesn't seem to tie in with what we know of the children of the forest. Uh, Alhad uh, Parashtika saying, hi, Robert, how do the Starks fit in the story uh, of the first long night? And who kept the cache of the dragonglass near the fist? Uh, Bloodraven. Um, so, so the dragonglass was put there by one of Bloodraven's proxies, is my take. Um, I don't think it was him personally, because he's already all um, hooked up. But it was put there by one of his proxies, quite possibly cold hands. Um, in terms of how the Starks uh, fit in with the first long night, um, I think there's a chance that the uh, the last hero was a Stark. Um, I think that there's a chance that they were involved somehow in both the uh, creation of the others and also the pushing back of the others there's i mean if we are going with this working theory that the others came from a human or some humans that the children of the forest did some magic on to turn into others then if they were starks that does make sense of the how they have this sort of strange uh, mirror perverted version of uh, walking, being able to do it into dead things rather than live things, uh, because the Starks obviously have that ability within them. So that that seems to be how it's there. But in any event, the Starks were the people that it was decided it was them who was going to be who were going to be in charge of the defenses going forward. The creation of Winterfell was definitely a part of this defense network that was going on brand the builder the first member of house stark built the wall with the help of the children of the forest the and and uh the giants so they were intertwined with this second defense which seems to imply that they were involved in the war itself 
uh, cloaked one again. Thank you. Picking up for something somebody else is for Warren Blythe. Fire and Blood offers a few guesses about Rhaenyra's relationship with Kristen Cole. Why do you think George R. R. Martin drew attention to the casting of this one character, uh, Kristen Cole, on his blog? Yeah, that was a bit weird. He doesn't normally do casting reveals, um, uh, but he did reveal one on his blog. I, did, I wonder. I, I, I wonder whether it was something as simple as him saying, I want to associate myself with this, because he has been involved in pre-production for this. Um, and I think he was saying, I want to be in, uh, seen to be a part of the team here. Um, they'd already announced the, the main names, but said, OK, well, you can announce this other name if you'd like to do that and he said yes that's absolutely great it could be something as simple as that uh, is it because there's something about Kristen cole that he particularly likes i mean maybe he's a favorite character um and we're not aware of it i don't think it means that he's a specifically important character over and above what we've, we've already been told in fire and blood uh so my we we're talking about Occam's razor a moment ago. My Occam's razor on this one is that this is simply that he wanted to announce something to a attach himself to the show because he will have been very excited because this is the first of this multi million pound deal that he's or multi million dollar deal that he's been doing with HBO and he wants to be involved in it. And they said, okay, you can announce this if you want to. Um, uh, Mara Lee, uh, thank you for the super sticker. Uh, I've got questions from you coming up in just one moment, but thank you so much. That's a very kind. Uh, Kofi uh, Amankwa saying, um, George R. R. Martin has said in the winds of winter, we will go further north than we have before. What do you think we will see and from whose POV will we see it through? This is something which has been bugging me too. He has said that. And to say that we're going to go further north than we have before says further north than the Fist of the First Men. Um, I don't think we're going to have anyone ranging that far north um, out of the main character. So the characters that we've got, I don't think we're just suddenly going to get this huge attack going far north. The only way, therefore, that we're going to see this um, I think is if we get um, a couple of things, either someone's recollections, someone like Benjen, perhaps um, remember him. Uh, Benjen, uh, now he his um, disappearance near the beginning of book one seems like a huge long time ago uh, in the story. It was one of the big mysteries in book one. John thinks about it. I was looking at when I'm doing my reread, uh, every John chapter thus far that I've got to, and I think I'm like six or seven in, every single one he thinks about John. He thinks about Benjamin. He is, this, this is a big deal. People talk about where Benjamin is. John's there saying, no, he's definitely alive. This is this is a big issue. And then they go and do this huge ranging north to try and find him. And lots of exciting things happen, but they do not find Benjamin. This is just left hanging in the air all the time. We're told, you know, John saying he's not dead, uh, and people saying, you know, he's very, very good and experienced. Uh, he wouldn't um, just go missing. So it's possible, and this isn't a prediction, it's just a possibility that he decided having gone out and found a few things and uh, thought the others are coming, it's possible that he has pushed on even further north, north than we know and is then going to come back and then we're going to see it through his recollections. Then another option is Bran. Bran has already been in his dream early in book one, uh, one he was asleep and blood raven showed him the world he did pass far far north so it's possible that he could do that again uh, so that is another way that we might be able to see it 
Um, and then we're starting to scrape a, a few barrels. There are we've got um, candles now, glass candles that would allow us to do a, 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 to see stuff. Uh, who might get hold of one? Sam, Danny, perhaps. I don't know. There are people who might, uh, but uh, it's not clear. George R. Martin has definitely set it up. John's looking to be going south uh, rather than north. Um, everyone else largely has abandoned the uh, the wall. Melisandre, as a POV character, that is. Melisandre is still there, but she's not going to be going any further north. Uh, Bran is going to be heading south, so the options are actually quite limited. Um, mm -mm, I think that's me caught up on the chat. Let's have a quick look back at questions from my patrons. Uh, Knights who say Sledge saying, howdy, Robert, howdy. Thank you, as always, for your channel and your work here. Um, one of my favourite elements... Uh, you're welcome. One of my favourite elements of these books is how... It has all of these layered additional stories sort of hidden within it, like a never-ending Chinese puzzle box. Of all those additional stories, I think my favourite is The Tragedy of Summer Hall. Um, you and some of your guest speakers have really helped me dig into these hidden narratives hinted at through the series. Which is your favourite of the mysterious stories subsumed within the main narrative? And who has helped open up this world to you uh, to see some of the discrete narratives more clearly? I'm guessing I'm asking for your origin story, not so much as a fan of the books, but as an active deconstructor. If that's a word of various analyses of the many stories buried within this story. Um, it, fascinating question. In terms of stories within stories, yeah, I think the tragedy at Summer Hall is absolutely fascinating. One. I, I'm personally really I'd obsessed is probably the wrong word but the 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 attorney at Harren Hall for me is the biggie I would so love to know what happened there the idea that this is going to be made into a stage play had me grinning for days uh, that George R. R Martin was going to write it the idea that we're going to learn some of these uh, things so that's absolutely fascinating uh, in terms of uh, creators who've helped open things up for me. I'm just going to take this as an opportunity to uh, to try and point you towards some excellent people within this community. So I mentioned the Disputed Lands earlier, Amanda, who is excellent and, and uh, several times has opened my mind up to things like uh, the, uh, the Valerians and what they were doing with all the genetic stuff there with... Uh, uh, pushing uh, different types of um, creature together. Um, I've uh, Lady Gwyn from uh, Radio Westeros hat tip also to uh, Yoke Boy. Um, the amount of times I've just been randomly looking at stuff on the internet, read an article and go, well, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I love that. And then spotted it was her. The number of times that's happened is, is huge. Uh, she's really excellent um i'd also highly recommend history of westeros who do uh brilliant things um if you want someone who knows huge amounts about it um con of thrones which is sort of the the biggest uh game of thrones only a convention out there they do quizzes sometimes but it hasn't happened for a couple of years but they do quizzes and the reigning champion of of a Song of Ice and Fire knowledge is Aziz from um, the history of Westeros. So I highly recommend you go check them out. And the only the other, and I'm going to put this as a group, um, uh, the Mythheads. I don't even know whether they still call themselves the Mythheads anymore. Um, but in terms of understanding the extra layers of symbolism, uh, there is a whole raft of people who have... Uh, analyzed uh, that and so what's the use of color what's what's george r martin trying to use uh symbolically here uh, so uh that's there's a whole host of people i could uh, mention from that so um yeah there are some excellent people out there that i would highly recommend you go and, and check out gem edition we talked about earlier joe matt uh uh comes out sometimes with some wild and wacky theories that I wouldn't necessarily agree with, but I always love his brain uh, because it works so wonderfully. And uh, I, I'm he 
picks up on things that many of the rest of us do not uh, and it takes them off into very logical directions and that's uh, again somebody else i'd recommend that you go and check out um uh, JVL, what about Ned and Ashara being Danny's parents? Danny has a stark like honor uh, and loyalty hang up. Ice and fire, uh, Karth uh, is Ashara. So, Quaith, I think you're meaning there, is, is that Ashara? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I don't personally, I think that the facts fit for Ashara and Howland Reed to have got together. I think that that works perfectly across many, many different levels. Um, I did a video on that, if you're interested in that. Um, the the idea that Ned and Ashara had Danny um, doesn't really work in terms of Danny is very clearly Targaryen or Valyrian, and neither ned is clearly very stark and the danes although yes they have purple eyes and all the rest of it georgia martin has stated very explicitly that they are not valerians uh, so uh, that doesn't work for her with her targaryen -y things that she has the the dragon dreams the resistance to fire um uh, not fire immunity but she does have a high resistance to heat and fire the dragon bonding and all the rest of it. So that doesn't quite work for me. Quaith, um, I think, is Shira Cesar, personally. Um, question from Cloaked One saying, no question. Oh, uh, but thank you very much. I, I want to say that I appreciate you answering all of these super chats in your usual in-depth and patient style. You're amazing. Well, thank you. Um, I do try to... Uh, uh, not just gloss over stuff, but actually give a full answer to things. So um, yeah, keep them coming. Uh, thank you. Sebastian Holden, will Bran's rule be peaceful? The Lords have been destructive without much Targaryen action so far. Ending House Targaryen seems like a cop-out to the true issues. Um, yes, so will it be peaceful? Will We won't see it. We will just see the beginning of it, so we don't know. And what that will be is a a continent devastated by war trying desperately to get climb up of the floor that's that's the world that we're going to see um is having assuming king bran which is i think now looking very likely um assuming king bran happens is that going to end all war and strife no it definitely won't um but i think it may well usher in a period of uh, of peace while there is some reconstruction going on uh, the the point that is there which i made earlier about the iron throne going means that this is not about rule by uh, conquest anymore the if you're looking for themes in this what we had with the iron throne was the exemplification the symbol of rule by conquest because the targaryens came in this was the people who bent the knee and handed over their swords and those swords were all melted down to create the iron throne that is that symbol because the targaryens were not from westeros and they came in bran is the representative of Westeros because he is the representative of the Weirwood Network and the Weirwood Network are Westeros in a way that nothing else possibly can be. And the Starks are the representatives of the first men. So this is a changing of the guard is what we're symbolically seeing. It's Westeros reasserting itself um, rather than all of these foreign invaders. That doesn't mean that it's going to be peaceful. The, the Starks lived at war for millennia. Uh, but it does mean that it's a it's a change. Um, question from um, Monkismo: Why do some people in the fandom tie themselves into linguistic and logical knots to argue that there is no magic in Lord of the Rings and A Song of Ice and Fire? Cheers from NC. Um, no magic in Lord of the Rings and A Song of Ice and Fire. I do not know. Uh, I've not seen that argued at all coherently, I have to say. Uh, so um, happy to 
be sent a link on that one but um uh no, there, there, there is magic in so in a lord of the rings if you wish to tie yourself into some logic and linguistic uh not then i could certainly say that this is just the way that the world is uh, and so some characters can do things it's, it's not magic per se in terms of bending the laws of the world because the 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 power that they have ultimately comes from the creator of of the world Aru Luvatar uh, and therefore it's not magic this is just using the rules which are created but that's a kind of a linguistic as you say a linguistic knot to get yourself into at a, an experienced level then it is magic uh, a song of ice and fire the interesting thing, I mean, I don't disagree with it in the slightest. The interesting thing that we have with A Song of Ice and Fire is that it started other than, in book one, other than the the prologue and effectively the epilogue, the very beginning when we see this first little bit of the others and the very end when the dragons are hatched, this reads like low fantasy. This is, that there's not, much magic going on yes we've got the brand thing but this is all dreams and things like that uh, it it feels the the characters that we're being told are clever and knowledgeable maester lewin Tyrion, scoff at magic and magical beings and all the rest of it that so we're we're being brought up as if this is a low fantasy setting the deeper into the story we get the higher fantasy story this this becomes so um by the end we're not just going to have dragons and some people being resurrected we're going to have euron doing magical fireworks everywhere with krakens and the dragons flying overhead and the others coming this is going to be magic absolutely everywhere um so yeah that's just a, a, an observation from uh reading a song of ice and fire uh which also i personally think sorry digression again i personally think helps explain how a fantasy tv series managed to conquer the world because it started out not very fantasy-ish and the fantasy stuff slowly eased its way in rather than appeared if we started out episode one uh with uh people with magic flaming swords and undead armies and dragons and uh, not, yeah fireballs or whatever then that would not have been i think as easily accessible as what appeared very much as sort of a, a faux medieval world uh christopher aquaviva just wanted to say thank you for everything oh you're very welcome your game of thrones and lord of the rings content is amazing and my go-to during study breaks in medical school cheers well uh good luck in medical school um and i'm um, feel quite honored that i can uh, help you through that in your breaks uh, a question from berus aurelius epic stream robert yeah we're still going quite this is long i'm i'm wondering whether i need to speed up uh this is going a long time anyway thank you for all the uh, fantastic content what do you make of all the detailed descriptions of food in a song of ice and fire is martin a foodie i think the short answer to that one is yes uh i think so he does if you've not picked up on it he does um pause longingly over his descriptions of the food in feasts and various things um i don't i don't think there's anything more to it than that i i, I wish i could add an extra bit of um uh interpretation onto it but no i think he just likes food uh brian sheerin do you think tisha is with Littlefinger? uh mother to the sailor's daughter maybe he seems to know a lot and tell sense of the story from her point of view um i, I mean I, so this is Tyrion's um first wife um who was badly treated by Tywin. Um, is she with Littlefinger? I don't think so, personally. Um, uh, mother to the sailor's daughter, maybe, maybe. Uh, but he seems to know a lot and tells sense of the story from her point of view. Uh, well, I mean, I think that Tyrion will... Uh, this is Tyrion's story rather than Littlefinger's. Um, I wouldn't necessarily 
listen to what he says. Uh, Reed Temple, thank you very much for the super chat or sticker. I didn't see a question attached to that one. Do let me know um, uh, if there was one. Uh, Mara Lee. Um, hi, I think I saw you there in the chat, actually, Mara. Um, thank you so much. Uh, you did a super chat before we went on air saying just a show of love and appreciation for all that you are doing on both your channels to get us through the long night. This nurse is so appreciative. Hugs to your gorgeous dog, Dan. Uh, on the And then question on the House of the Dragon TV show. Of course, it will be cool to see all the dragons, but other than the dragons, what characters and story arcs are you most interested in seeing portrayed on the show and why? Um, uh, yeah, a really interesting stuff. Uh, people saying new record in the chat. Is this the longest I've ever gone? It's possible. Um, anyway, uh, what am I most looking forward to? So Alice Rivers, we talked about earlier. I would love to see how they deal with that, but there are several other excellent characters. Um, Laris strong the clubfoot is like this if you've not read it he's like varis plus plus he's um uh, he changes sides three or four times he knows all of the secrets of the red keep he's enigmatic we never know exactly what's uh, whose side he's really on and then at the end of it all he seems to just uh, accept his death with this strange equanimity uh, equanimity and it's just what what's he all about he he will be an absolutely fascinating character to dig into but i think the character not just me i know a number of people think this mushroom who is this uh he was a dwarf like Tyrion. he was a court fool court jester and he wrote another history of this era and um it's more ribald than the version that the maesters like but he was undoubtedly there and he undoubtedly did see things and undoubtedly did hear things and so the maesters who wrote or the maester who wrote um fire and blood had to include references to his stories uh which are always a lot more fun and a lot dirtier than the ones that the maesters come up with uh and i would love to see his character and also how they deal with some of the, I mean, most of the time they can get away with this with simple TV tricks, but whether they do nods to Mushroom's version of events, which sometimes presumably were right, rather than the official version of events recorded by the Maesters. So that's uh, that's something I'm particularly looking forward to. Um, uh, Kairos Ballerina, if we never see the future, how will we know Brand's tax policy? Uh, what could his or the Weirwood Net's tax policy possibly be, possibly be? Does good or evil triumph here? Well, if you're a fan of my tax policy uh, videos, then you'll be delighted to know. I just finished, literally today, I just finished writing um uh, what is Joffrey Baratheon's tax policy um as a video uh, so I need to record that and add the visuals and all the rest of it so it'll still be another week or more before it appears but uh you will be getting that um in terms of Bran's tax policy um in the short term I think think that it will have to be very easy on the seven kingdoms in order to or six kingdoms as it may be in order to allow uh, some form of economic recovery that's uh that's where i would definitely go um but broadly speaking there are several layers of tax policy within westeros in the the post aegon's conquest world there is a feudalist uh tithing-ish system uh, where you the, the local people uh, pay their dues to their local lords and the local lords pay it up the tree so it goes up to the Lord Paramount and then up to the crown. Um, this is like mill use and things like that. Uh, paying a tenth of the of the uh, the corn milled at, at mills goes to the lord that kind of thing. Um, then you get another layer which are uh, 
continent-wide taxes. The most notable of these are customs taxes. George R. Martin does the and port taxes. George R. Martin pays a lot of attention to these. Uh, they get mentioned several times. There's one type for the defiance of Duskendale is an example. Uh, that was all about the fact, or prompted by the fact that uh, Lord Darklin, the Lord of Duskendale, had seen that his port had lost out all of its trade to the new city of King's Landing, just down the coast, uh, and he wanted to have the ability to reduce the port tariffs in his own port, and only the king could do that, and that was where that standoff came from. So port taxes are hugely important. Finally, we read a lot about specific taxes in King's Landing, which the monarch can decide to do, and these, I think, will have an important role going forward in the story when Circe is in charge of doing it. But if you want more details on that, please do look in uh, the video when that one appears. Uh, Mara Lee, uh, thank you. Uh, you're being very generous, Mara. Thank you so much. Saying here's to Mushroom and his version of events. He is a great character in Fire and Blood. He is absolutely. Um, Sebastian Holden. Uh, Kyburn tells Cersei an afterlife experience at the Citadel. Was the ghost he believed really just a real woman who snuck out of the room like Sheer? Um, okay, so I think that. I think you're referring to when he tells, I think he tells Jamie this story when he's explaining the afterlife and, and he says um, when he was in the, uh, the Citadel, he went into a room and he knew that a woman had been sitting on a chair in the room, uh, but had just left. Uh, and he knew that because there was still a hint of her fragrance in the air and he could see the impression of where she had been sitting in the chair. And he said, it's like that when somebody dies, something lingers for a while. That's the phrase he uses. Uh, and that seems to be the basis of his research is that his, him saying something lingers of the human soul um, after the body dies which seems about right. He seems to have actually, we may not like Kyburn as a person, but he seems to he seems to have nailed this in terms of the scientific understanding of the magical world that he's in, uh, it, because the longer someone's gone, then the less of them there is left. And we see that in Beric Dondarrion, we see it in Lady Stoneheart, etc., 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 throughout this. And that is... That is the basis for him creating the reanimated Robert Strong, the zombie mountain, because, and, and he does this through this basis of something lingering. So um, uh, did, did, he didn't think it was actually a ghost. He was using this as an example, as a way to um, show the principle behind the research that he was doing. Um, read uh, Temple uh, saying, shoot, original question as follows below. I will have a look for that question when it appears. Uh, James F. Palm. Uh, Hello, Robert. What do you think of the idea that Robert Strong has Rob Stark's head? Joffrey badly wanted Rob's head, and it is suggested that it was sent to King's Landing. We never hear about it, but it may have been intercepted by people who did not want him to present it to Sansa. And ultimately ended with Kyburn. Um, meanwhile, they sent Gregor's giant head to Dawn. Um, you get a big body without a head and also a head without a body. The name Robert Spro Strong may also be a big clue. Um, P.S. Hope you can do more Song of Ice and Fire live streams during the summer when I'm not lecturing. Live streams will carry on through the summer, don't worry. I will be taking occasional weeks off, as I always do every now and then, just to recharge. In fact, I think in two weeks' time I will be doing that. Um, but they will be carrying on through the summer. Do not worry. In terms of the heads, I think my interpretation is that Robert Strong does not have a head, which is really... Yeah. But again, dark, like George R. R. Martin, can go sometimes. The head was sent to Dawn. Uh, I think that that is pretty clearly uh, the head of the mountain. Uh, he has been reanimated, or his body has been reanimated by Kyburn, but with the armor on, and the helmet is sort of locked down in place. And people in the uh, the last bit of A Dance with Dragons, in, in, even I think in the epilogue that people are muttering, you know, have we ever even seen his head? He never takes his helmet off. He never eats. When you look, you just see this dark, 
darkness inside, I think he has not got a head. Is, is the is the gruesome but um, honest answer. Um, Kendra Summers. Hello, Robert. Well, going back through the books again, now almost through A Clash of Kings. Excellent. One reoccurring statement sticks out to me. May the others take you. It is said by many characters. Could this be a hint to a man's responsibility for offerings to the others, much like Crusted did? I'm beginning to have a feeling that the man is the baddie in the other's world. The villain is the hero in their own story. Well, I think the villain is the hero in their own story is absolutely right. Um, this is something George R. Martin has said many times. Um, may the others take you I, is a, sort of a convenient phrase, I think, rather than anything else. I don't think the humanity has a responsibility to make offerings, but I think that it has got a collective memory that uh, the others take people. Uh, and this is, again, another hint to uh, the, the fact that the others come from humans. Um, Andrew K saying that video could be the opening salvo in the fandom wars. Lord of the Rings fans don't like the Aragorn tax policy comments. Could be the same the other way around. So it begins. Well, yeah, yeah I, I always like to spark a discussion. Um, uh, read Temple. I'm just trying to see whether you did do a question. Uh, oh, saying I loved your stream with Bronsteris. Uh, oh, excellent. He's a lovely chap and he has got some excellent insights. I find the others intriguing and uh, would love to know your thoughts on them. Aside from sharing the pettiness of political squabbles and being an apocalyptic force, well, it's the, the, it's the fact that we do not know about them at the moment is the interesting thing. Um, thematically, you're right that they are those things, uh, but I think we just have to wait now. Uh, Melissa Gill, uh, with a few questions, um, uh, which... Uh, saying, why do they have to heat the water for Jane Poole's bath when they rescued her? I thought Winterfell had heated water running through it, and Kat mentioned taking hot baths. I think there is a very short answer. I think they say bring her hot water if she's up in one of the towers. Uh, the water, hot water comes up from springs. Do you think Theon will be sacrificed at the Crofter's village, or does he have more story? I think he has more story. I think that this is Stannis thinking he has to sacrifice Theon because he thinks that he killed the Stark boys. He did not kill the Stark boys. I think that there's there are hints that the the tree slash the uh, ravens will cry out against that. But also, um, we've got Rick on himself coming. And uh, the Mandalays know that Rickon is alive, and they are coming with that. Uh, with the battle which is about to happen is theoretically the phrase in the Mandalays against Stannis's army. The Mandalays will not be fighting Stannis; they will be fighting the phrase, and they will bring the news that Rickon is alive. Therefore, Theon does not have to be killed. Uh, will Queen Selyse go along with Shireen's birth? Uh, burning she's much more affectionate towards her in the books um yeah i think she will uh, i think that she's much more um uh, she's saying i know she's crazy about relor and melisandre but would she really go against her own interest i don't think she cares about being queen so much as uh, now she's fully bought into the worship of, of relor um uh, Eamon Fox, uh, do not worry at all. Uh, I understand not everyone can donate. This isn't. I never ask for for it at all. But uh, wanted to thank me for my knowledge and passion. Um, you are very welcome. Uh, that's uh, very kind of you to say so. Um, and you're asking Melissa Gill about Barbara Dustin. Is she really as anti Ned or Stark? as She seems, or will she portray the Boltons from the inside? Sixteen years is a long time to hold a grudge. Maybe she'll be the one to stab Roos in the heart. Um, I think she's anti-Ned. I think that that is definitely the case. I think she has held that grudge. She makes that very clear to Theon, uh, thinking that Theon's not going to tell anyone because he's being weak. Um, but I think that she is not anti-Stark. She clearly loved Brandon Stark, so she's not anti-Stark, and I think that she is um, definitely going to be 
bring helping bring the Boltons down from inside. I think that she's on the Mandley's side. Um, Sylvester Snow saying, Hello, Robert. Uh, can you please talk some about the island of Ib and the Ibanese? What is their history and what will be their role, if any, in the future? Um, uh, this is, if you imagine Iceland, this is what they are like. Uh, the, the history of Ib, it's an island off the north of Essos, very cold, whaling ships going on. George R. Martin says it's about the size of Iceland. Um, their history was they there are dragon bones there, so dragons were there at some time. Historically, they had the hairy men, who was also this mysterious race who uh, were over Essos. And um, what role are they going to have? I think not much. I think not much. Uh, Greasy Strangler saying, Greetings, Robert, and everyone listening. Seven blessings to you all. How do you think the faith militant and the wider followers of the faith of the Seven will react to Cersei blowing up the Sept? What differences do you think there will be the show and any wider consequences for the Lannisters? Um, it, well, so on the show, it was like that was the end of the threat from the Faith of the Seven. I think that is not going to be the case in the books because they will the, the Faith of the Seven stretches across the Seven Kingdoms, um, and it will just anger people. However, the other stronghold for the Faith of the Seven is in Old Town, and at around the same time, Old Town is going to get destroyed almost certainly by Euron. So um, the Faith of the Seven is going to be weakened and probably won't be able to react in the way that it would want to, not just by Cersei, but also by Euron accidentally. Donald Peoples uh, saying, wow, came for a rewatch and still caught you live. Uh, super chat for my sacrifice sleep. Well, thank you very much. Yes, it is getting quite late. I'm talking quicker now, you might have noticed. Uh, Sebastian Holden saying, Robert, please say googly woogly. I'm very happy to. Googly woogly. Um, it's very kind. Uh, and then a couple of last questions uh, from my patrons, actually from, from Mara Lee. I don't know if you're still in the chat, Mara, uh, saying these are slightly wider from just talking about A Song of Ice and Fire. In the Lord of the Rings TV show that will soon air, the focus will be on the rise and fall of Numenor, as well as the forging of the rings. I know that we won't see anything about the Third Age, but where would you like to see the showrunners ending so that it ties in nicely to what we will eventually read about in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Uh, in terms of where I would like it to end, so for those who don't know at all the background to this, Amazon have bought the rights to the Second Age, which is the Age of Numenor, which is this great uh, island kingdom for humans, and it's from Numenor that people like Isildur uh, come from. And that will be destroyed, it will sink down into the, uh, the sea, um, how I would like the series to end ultimately in, in the end, either at that point with the end of Numenor, it was quite a big destruction, or if they want to, they could take it all the way up to Sauron, then uh, a bit after that, he's back in Mordor, and he then starts attacking the lands of humanity and the remaining Numenorians, um, and that is the scene we saw at the beginning of the Lord of the Rings films, let, which led to Isildur cutting the ring off of Sauron's finger and that would bring it right up to the films which I think would work really well for sort of the TV film audience um, and uh, you also asked Mara about the Witcher series which is coming back Q4 of this year so October, November, December uh, what characters and storylines are you most interested in seeing? Well this is coming for those who read the books this is going to be largely based on Blood of Elves um, although dipping into the short stories again because there's some more that they hadn't picked up on. Uh, Care Moorhen, which is the effective training castle college for the witches, is definitely going to be making an appearance, and I am definitely excited uh, for that, to see more of the witches rather than just the one, uh, and to see um, a series sort of growing strength and powers. Uh, okay, I think with that, normally I dip into the chat and do a few more questions, but I think with that, given how late we are getting, I am going to start pour, uh, calling that one a day. I will be back next week, uh, and I think I'm going to do a live stream 
on North of the Wall, because I actually didn't do that when I was uh, doing my series of videos across the piece, and a couple of people asked me if I'd done stuff for North of the Wall, so I thought, I'll do a live stream on it. Anyway, uh, if you're interested in more videos like this and you are watching back later, there will be a link appearing somewhere around here. If you wish to support uh, this channel and support what I do um, and or get access to uh, patron benefits like getting priority questions on these live streams, then there will be a link appearing somewhere around here. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Fantastic questions in the chat today. Uh, really, really good stuff. Uh, take care, everyone, and I will see you again next week.